now uh, I want to do uh, magic using elf. Magic. So, All right. Awesome. Awesome. So, okay. Yeah. So there are uh, there are a bunch of different kinds of spellcasters. I think uh, for my recommendation is the the two main kinds of spellcasting are from sorcerers and warlocks. So here's the difference with the okay. two of them. Sorcerers are beings that were born with magical power. So they so uh, they're born with them. They have different kinds of ancestry on how they got their powers. Now the warlock on the other hand, the person who made their pact with a powerful enemy. And that's how they get their power. So the downside to having a warlock is that their spell casting, the number of times they can cast spells a day, are quite limited. There is another type of spell caster that would be wizard. Although I personally don't recommend this for new players because uh, in order to be a really good wizard, you have to be familiar with about 30 different spells and there's like a lot of different mechanics. But if you're up for the challenge, wizards can also be really fun. So, uh, which one calls out to you the most? If you're a new spellcaster, um, though, I don't recommend. <laughs> how about an high, uh, uh, a high elf? Oh, a okay. uh, high elf. That would be a. So hold on. Let me let me uh, pull out my cheat sheet here. So if you want a high elf, uh, a high elf is a race. Uh, there are a lot of different races, in it. and some races are better for other classes. If you want them high elf, pull us here. I'm using the D and D Beyond app for this. Yeah, I'm on the D and D Beyond <laughs> app already. Yeah. All right. The high elf they get a bonus to to intelligence, so that would mean that they would be good wizard. But you can also try other versions of elf. Hold on. Hello? Yep, yep, yep. Sorry, sorry. Uh, still look for it. All right, here. If you want, you can try be like a drow elf. A dry elf is a drow elf is has a bonus to charisma, and uh, they would be good as sorcerers or warlocks. But if you really want to go high elf, you can still you can uh, go for wizard. But there is a bit more of a challenge if you wanted. Would you like to go for? Mm. Hmm? Well, what do you recommend? I would recommend that since you really want to play an elf, we go for drow, and then you can be a. I would personally recommend being a sorcerer because uh, they have a lot of different abilities for spell casting, and oh. they also. Uh, aside from that, the variety of spells is also quite high. The problem is with warlocks is that if you primarily want to be a spell caster, they find it a little too limited. Because you can only cast about the one or two spells uh, per short rest. So mm -hmm. okay. if you wanna get like if, if you really wanna be the ideal spellcaster, like the ones you see in movies a lot, I would personally mm -hmm. recommend sorcerer. Yeah, I think I would uh, I would go with sorcerer that you mentioned. I I was also thinking of uh, I used to play also World of Warcraft and mm -hmm. I was a dark priest, so that would cast spells <laughs> also. Okay. Um, um, so elf na draw elf, mm -hmm. tamaba na sorcerer. Actually, do, uh, do I go? Mm -hmm. Do I go oh. to my D and D beyond already? Actually, no, it's okay. Uh, you're in Discord. Can you just watch the turn on? Just start, check the live stream. I'm uh, making the D and D beyond on my end. Hold on, let me. I'm uh, trying to DM focus. Yeah. D and B. I have a question. Uh, yeah. What's up? Are you going to introduce the concept of uh, custom origins from Tasha's, so that, oh, uh, yeah. for example, Actually, they want if they want to be a high if they want to be a high elf, you don't have to you can choose to be a high elf, but instead of uh, upping your intelligence, you could swap that out with a stat that you really want. That way, they can be the race that they want without having to force themselves to compromise the ability score increase, so that they don't have to worry about making quote unquote optimized characters. Not that, that there's a problem with choosing to make an optimized one or an unoptimized one in the first place. Yes. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot about that. The cost, there's a, the custom lineage that was uh, introduced a few months ago now allows you to get uh, different stat bonuses. Thank you for that, DM Corgi. 
So that was one of our uh, other DM friends, DM Corgi. So yes, actually, you can actually be a high elf now and uh, get your bonuses for sorcerer. So would you like to stick with high elf, Carl? Yeah. Um, yeah. DM Bear question. No? Mm-hmm. I- I'm I'm using Discord on my phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you know on how I can focus on your screen on your? Yeah, sure. So you should see this one. Just tap Mr. Bear, and then you'll be able to. Uh, there's an option that'll pop out that says "Watch Stream." Um, if you're talking about uh, if you're talking about trying to zoom in on your phone, yeah. I think depending on the kind of phone you have, if you tilt your phone. Um, Landscape ah, wise, it, it just... should it should show you the option. If you can tilt it landscape wise, it will allow you to uh, view it closely. I think that's what you're asking. No, I'm trying to see uh, the embers uh, stream using my phone. Hold on, let me uh, uh, check it from my phone as well. <laughs> Wait, alam ko na. Let me. Uh, open my Discord on my computer, but awesome. listen through phone. Yeah, that works. I too. can see. Yeah, that'll work too. <laughs> yeah. So, like what uh, DM Corgi said, I, I can still use a, a, a high elf. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you so much for that, DM Corgi. Uh, that's actually uh, uh, that that uh, was actually not allowed. It was only allowed on on certain certain kinds of uh, games before but last month i believe they they allowed it for regu- for historic games as well so yes you can definitely be a high l and uh based on what you mentioned earlier with your ba- with how you wanted to play elves because of their magic background i think you'd really enjoy mm. being a high l <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's what i was looking into awesome yeah. all right uh... So while you're loading on your com- while you're loading the uh, live stream on your computer, let me just go ahead and select high L for you. Hold on, let me pull up my cheat sheet here because like there's so many races here in D and D. I don't I, personally I don't re- I don't memorize all of them yet, but uh, yeah, there's a lot to choose from. That's why I really love doing these character creation tutorials. Because that because like uh for a new, imagine for a new player getting overwhelmed with all of these different races, all of these different classes and all different spells, it can really get uh, overwhelming. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, and in Adventurous style. League alone. Yeah. In Adventurous League alone, the Ember, there's over sixty. Sixty mm. plus plus so far. In Adventurous League alone. If mm. you consider the other uh, source books allow uh the other source books created for D&D, it reaches about 100 plus. Yes, so imagine exactly. if you're a new player, you'll be like, oh my god, 62. I can't. I just can't. Exactly. Uh, that's why, <laughs> that's why, you know, that's why I also like doing these uh, tutorials to help uh, new players navigate and um, um, uh, make sure that they make the character that they really want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we are also joined here by a lot of our friendly DMs. We have DM Mars, DM Watson, DM Polar, DM Corgi. DM Corgi and DM Polar will actually be DMs for our upcoming event this February 28th. So registration for that event is only 140 pesos. And you get the access to all the games lined up on that day. And as, al- an, along with that, you also get a gift certificate worth two hours of gameplay in the Tabletop Lounge's physical location. So I hope that, you, that everyone listening can uh, can purchase a ticket because it's really going to be a fun event. Right, guys? Yay! <laughs> uh, <French. laughs> All right. Uh, so, Carl, how are, how are you, how's the street, how's the uh, viewing going? Can you see? Yeah. It now? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Loud and clear. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So first, uh, first things we're going to do is to take a look at your uh, race features here. So you have dark vision, which is mm-hmm. always good. Like I've had parties that went into a dungeon, nobody had any means of seeing in the dark, so they had to pull out torches. And you kind of can't hide when you see it when you're carrying a big torch around you. <laughs> so dark vision yeah. is actually super mm-hmm. useful. Next up, you have your keen senses. So you have proficiency in perception. We'll get to that later. 
You have a uh, fey ancestry, which means you have save uh, you have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic cannot put you to sleep. Uh, another thing that's interesting is that elves don't need to sleep; they get they go into a trance. Um, you don't really need to worry about this because uh, um, it doesn't exactly help you out too much unless you unless your party needs to take a long rest and somebody needs to stay on watch. All you need to remember is that you can get the benefits of a long rest within four hours instead of eight hours. Next up, you have a cantrip of your choice. We'll get to that later. Uh, now let's go on to your ability scores. So hold on, let me just fix the settings here. I remember D&D Beyond released some new settings for this. Hold on. So uh, what type of... Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about your character? Like, uh, why did they become an adventurer while I'm fixing the settings? Uh, uh, you know, I, really, I haven't even thought of the, the history of the character. <laughs> but, um, no worries. Uh, do you play Magic the Gathering? Yeah, I love Magic. I used to love Magic the Gathering. I remember uh, the reason why I got into D and D is that I, re- I my wallet felt a little too empty after about a year of Magic the Gathering. <laughs> so <laughs> it made all my it, it made all my savings disappear. But yeah, I went into D and D because it's uh, more more wallet friendly. <laughs> but yeah, what about uh, Magic the Gathering? So um, there's this character there that uh, really got me interested in. Uh, his name is Jace. Oh, Jace, yeah, the mind sculptor. No, uh, he's a planeswalker. <laughs> so uh, read his background, and uh, he was trained to be a magician, stuff like that, and became well-known sorcerer. So mm. I'm looking into. Uh, that kind of uh, instead of human, I was looking into uh, L. L, got you, got you. <laughs> All right, so I have your settings uh, set up. So now you can get your you have your bonuses to intelligence and dexterity. That's uh, um, that would be best for your uh, for your sorcerer. Oh, sorry, not intelligence. That should be charisma. My bad. Give me a second. It's actually my first time doing these uh, custom origins because it's still something that's pretty new for me. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is that we're going to arrange these scores from highest to lowest. Now, as a sorcerer, you get your you get your pow- you get your powers from your charisma. So the higher your charisma, the more powerful your spells will be. So personally, I would recommend putting charisma as your highest. And then strength as your lowest because you never you never really see a spellcaster go into hand to hand combat. So I yes. personally don't think you need strength. So I need you to rank these from highest to lowest. And if you need a clarification on what one of them does, just let me know. I'm happy to answer as many questions as you may have. Okay, for the I did some research already, and uh, I have uh, abilities for Randy. Mm-hmm. And then let me know what you think. Sure, go for it. So strength would be eight. Okay. Dexterity. Um, wait, you told me to focus on wisdom or intelligence. For your for your character, if you are yeah. a sorcerer, it, uh, I would recommend charisma. You get your bonus goes to you can make your bonus go to anywhere. But the build that would be best for you is to get a bonus to Charisma. I'm a High Elf Sorcerer. High Elf Sorcerer, yes. Pretty fun wizard. Oh, you want to be a wizard? Okay, sure. Definitely. You can definitely be a wizard, but just be prepared because there's a ton of spells that you have to be familiar with. And uh, there's a lot of different mechanics to being a wizard, but you did mention that you have a good background playing D and D, so I think you I think you can handle it. It's just going to be a bit more of a challenge, uh, but if you're up for it, then I totally support that. Would you like to go for a yeah, wizard? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I'll go with the wizard. Thank awesome. You. All right, so I'll go ahead and change it to wizard. 
So I'm just going to adjust your race bonus. So you're going to get a bonus to being a to intelligence instead of charisma. All right. So uh, let's. you have your abilities all set up here. Uh, I need you to rank these from highest to lowest. And then we can just make adjustments. Or if you want, we okay. can just use the one that you prepare. And constitution 14. Constitution at 14, gotcha. And dexterity also 14. Got you. Intelligence 15. Okay, noted. Wisdom 12. Wisdom at what, sorry? 12. 12, got you. And charisma will be at 8. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I can tell you really put some thought into this. Because one thing that we have to remember is that you're after the modifier, not necessarily the actual score. And modifiers only increase at even numbers. So all of your scores are nice even numbers. I think you're going to enjoy this character really well. So next up, we're going to go for your background. So you said that you wanted to be like Jace. He's a planeswalker. Um, I, let me ask you, what, uh, what makes you want to be in, what makes your character want to be an adventurer? Like, uh, what's their mission or what's their overall goal as a hero or adventurer? Okay, so, um, he just wants to be, uh, uh, one of the best wizards out there. Ah, I see, I see. All right, so kind, so pretty close to the to the actual planeswalker Jace because he's uh he uses blue magic in Magic the Gathering, so that's uh that's the magic of intelligence. I think the car, I think the archetype that would fit you best would be the sage background. So the sage background is somebody who's spent years studying the lore of the multiverse, everything around it, and their overall goal is to learn as much as they can about the world. Or about their craft. Is that does that sound like your character? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Okay, great, great, great. So we're gonna get to these later. But now we're gonna go back to your class here. So these are so you you can be proficient in two of these skills. As a sage, you're already proficient with Arcana and history. So I need you to choose um, uh, amongst these four. Choose two skills that you want to be proficient in. And uh, and uh, if you need a clarification on what one of them does, just let me know. So, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, sorry, Carl. Uh, the audio is a little garbled. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Can, can you hear that? Sorry, uh, come again. Oh no, Carl! <laughs> we can't hear. Uh, we can't hear you. <laughs> oh, um, can you try? Hello, like... there, oh, there, there. Can you much hear me better. now? Much better. Much okay. Better. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, what uh, can you recommend uh, additional proficiencies if using uh, this character? Hmm, I would say since uh, if we're sticking to the lore of Jace from Magic the Gathering, I yeah. think he he's more of a he's more of a person who really studies everything and comes with everything prepared. So I would recommend religion because that's the that means that you know the different gods and goddesses of the multiverse. So, for example, okay. like you enter a temple, uh, I think Jace would say, "Ah, yes, that is uh, that is the temple of Torm. Torm is the god mm -hmm. of this, this, this." Um, do you? Uh, uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think uh, religion would be nice. Great. All right, and next, uh, you can get another proficiency. Uh, if I can give a recommendation, I would say investigation. Because that would be Jace trying to fig to specifically look for things, uh, mostly things that he can learn from or things or sources of knowledge. Would you like investigation? Yeah, I think I was going uh, to choose that. Awesome! So. Great, great, great. All right. So one thing about level one wizards is they have what's called arcane recovery. 
So, once per day, when you finish a short rest, you can choose okay. expanded spell slots to recover. Now, they have to be a combined level that is equal to or less than half your wizard level rounded up. So that means you're you're now a level one wizard. Once you take a short rest, you can get uh, you can get one spell slot back because half your level rounded up. That's still gonna be one. At level two, it's still gonna be one. Level three, it's gonna be two. You understand? Yeah. Awesome. A question for yeah. for a short. How long is a long rest? One long rest is eight hours, and a short rest is so uh, two hours, I believe. So the DM will typically just tell you one hour. Thank you so much, DM Corky. <laughs> so, uh, so the DM will just tell you if it's a short rest or a long rest, or yeah, uh, you yeah. can ask your DM if you can ask your party if you can take a short or long rest. Okay. So, uh, uh, just to make sure, an arcane recovery after a short or long rest. Short rest. Short rest. I can recover one slot. Yes, because when you take a long rest, you recover all your spell oh, slots. Yeah. Yay. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh. Yep. I understand arcane recovery. One awesome. one slot for short rest and all for long rest. Okay. Got it. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, have you had any spellcasters before? Any spellcasting characters? Yeah, my previous <laughs> character uh, was a hunter that I would cast. Uh, Pay. Uh, yeah, I, I cast. I I know how to cast. Um, so I I had some casting spells with my previous character. Awesome, awesome. So you, do you already know the difference between spell slots and cantrips, or would you like a clarification? Yeah, could you clarify a cantrip? <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Sure, a cantrip is like an additional attack, right? Instead of of a spell. Uh, a cantrip is like an, is, is a. Uh, yeah, so uh, at level one, at this at this point, you know four spells, and you can cast a certain number of them. At level one, wizard, I believe you can only have you can only cast two spells. So that it, th- those are called spell slots. So that mm-hmm. is pretty limiting. Mm-hmm. Now, a cantrip does not consume a spell slot, so you can cast yeah, them as yeah. many times as you want per day. Many times, yeah, mm-hmm. correct, correct. Yeah. Yep, I got that. Awesome. Okay, so we're going. They to... are. They are still spells. Yes, they're they are. just spells that are level zero because they do not burn a spell slot. Yeah, they don't. It's like, uh, yeah, correct. I don't use a spell slot if I use a cantrip. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's correct. Right. Okay, got it. So, yep. uh, so let's go ahead and choose your prepared spells. So, like I said about being a wizard, it's kind of tough because there's a lot of different spells to choose spells. from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, um, I'm going to make a few recommendations. But if you have okay. any particular spells that you really want to have, then okay. uh, go ahead and chime them in. So, first off, I will give a recommendation on what I believe to be two essential wizard spells. This would be Mage Armor and yep, I agree. Shield. So, yes, mage armor is powerful for wizards because wizards don't w- really wear armor. So, with mage right. armor, your AC becomes 13 plus your dex modifier. So, you have your dex modifier at 3. Uh, that means that your AC 16. will become 16. Shield is Whoa. also very. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go on. Go Any ahead. Go, yeah, no, go, yeah, no, you go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, shield is also very powerful because you can use this as a reaction. If somebody hits you with a powerful attack and you don't want to take it, just hit shield and you get plus 5 to your AC. That'll bring up your AC to 21. But it should be, you should remember that you only have two spells at level 1. So, uh, you have to use your shield wisely if you get shield. Mage okay, armor okay. lasts for 8 hours. So, you can typically do that right before oh. you enter a dungeon or at the start mm-hmm. of the mod. Okay. So which one would which one calls out to you the most? Uh shield Actually, or mage armor? Both. Mm-hmm. Um I have uh, um yeah, both. I have two slots, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh no, I, sorry, um, sorry. Um here's how uh here's how wizards work. So, wizards carry a spell book. And you start off oh, yeah, with six book. with six spells. Spells. So yeah. you choose six spells. At the start mm-hmm. of a, after a long rest, you can prepare 
four of them at level one. Mm-hmm. And among it, those four, it. you can cast two. So got wizards, <laughs> there's a lot to take in for wizards. <laughs> No, actually, I understand. No, daming spells niya. And yeah, so I many. Did, I did my research already. Oh, perfect. I, perfect. I, I was too excited. Kasi <laughs> tagal ni DMK si magano eh, prepare eh. <laughs> and D, uh, DMK si ba or DM... Cab, ano, I think, I believe he thing? goes as DM Alpha Cabron. Alpha Cabron. Yeah, yeah. Alpha Cabron. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, you mentioned the Mage Armor and Shield. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this for cantrip or for spell? These are for spells. We'll get okay. your cantrips later on. Okay, I'll take it. Okay, you'll get Shield both of them? Armor. Yes. Awesome, okay. And every time you level up, you can add two more spells to your spell book. So... Add yeah. spell. So add mm-hmm. spell. Yes. But don't worry, we'll get, we'll get more into this later. And uh, okay. there's a lot, to, there's really a lot to take in with wizards. And uh, getting mm-hmm. over, and it's normal to get overwhelmed by them. So if you do get overwhelmed, please feel free to stop over at the Tabletop Lounge Discord server and ha- and hop on over to Character Help. Um, we have a lot of DMs here actually who will happily help you out, myself included. Sure, I'll just message my brother. <laughs> that works too. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So um, another spell that now that you have your um, your essential spells. I'm going to mm-hmm. recommend a few of my favorite damage dealing spells. So, okay. the first damage dealing spell that I would recommend would be Magic Missile. So, mm-hmm. Magic Missile is a is a really good spell because it will hit uh pretty basically 99% of the time. The only uh-huh. way to dodge a Magic Missile is if they have Maybe something 20. that specifically uh-huh. prevents a Magic Missile. Like for example, if a if you do Magic Missile on a spellcaster and they cast Shield then that's the only time the magic missile will miss. Otherwise, it will 100% hit the target. It, so, it, it, hmm? it won't... Uh, no need for to check the AC of the nope. other... AC does not matter. Even if they have okay. infinity AC, the magic missile will hit them. That's okay. how... There's no such thing as some infinity AC, by the way. I'll just use that as an example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right. So that's one. Another mm-hmm. powerful damage dealing spell would be Chromatic Orb. So Chromatic Orb, it's this one does require an AC, but if it hits a target, you can choose what type of damage to deal. There's acid, cold, fire, lightning, poison, or thunder. And it will deal 3d8 damage. So that's a maximum of 24 damage. While the magic missile only deals a little bit. A maximum of 4, 8, 12, uh, 15 damage. Ma- that would already be the maximum. So, but Magic Missile is a sure hit. Chromatic Orb, yeah. you do have to beat their AC. So, which one calls out to you more? Um, do I have to choose one? Or... No, you can get both of them if you'd like. I want to see kasi what other options I have. But, um, what what was the other one? Magic or- what? Chromatic Orb, Orb and Magic Chromatic Missile. Orb. Magic missile. I was looking because if I have, um, if I have to choose something with cantrip, um, mm-hmm. can I put that bus a cantrip? Yung magic missile or sadly no. There are spe- there there are only specific types of cantrips that you can choose. So these are locked in as leveled spells, but you will have okay. damage dealing cantrips. So you'll have to worry about that for now. Okay. Um, I will take the. Or if you want, you can just get both of them now and then swap them out later. That works. Okay. Too. Let's. Yeah. That that that, right. that that works. So we have four spells. So you mentioned you did read up on certain spells. Uh, do you have any yeah. particular spells that uh that you're really interested in, or do you, okay. you like more recommendations? Um, so that's four spells already I have, yep. right? You have and two I more get spells. Two more. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, with the spells that I prepared, mm-hmm. so I have Mage Armor, Shield, Magic Missile, Thunder Wave, Detect oh. Magic, mm-hmm. and Find Familiar. Oh, nice. Okay, those are really good. So we have Thunder Wave, Detect Magic, and Find Familiar. So, yeah. 
uh, you yeah, that's these though those are really solid uh level one wizard spells. Primarily, find familiar and detect magic. These two are called. You see this uh, R symbol here. That means yeah, that what, it what is does a. R mean? That's a ritual spell. That means that you can add ten minutes to the casting time, and if you do that, it will not consume a spell slot at all. Also, if you're a wizard, you don't have to choose to prepare those. You can yes. only you can cast them from your spell book. So as a, so, in addition to those two, you can actually get more spells. Uh, yes, good exactly. choice on Thunderwave. Good choice on Thunderwave because it is an area of effect spell that does not require you to see your target. Because a magic missile and chromatic orb requires you to be able to see your target. What mm-hmm. if you are in a where you can't see, you're or you're blind or something like that, or the enemy is invisible, whatever? At least with a spell like Thunder Wave, which is an area of effect, you will mm-hmm. be able to probably hit them because the other ones require sight. If you sight. don't have sight, you can't cast the spell. Yes, thank okay. you so much, DM. Okay. But yes, so with a with the ritual cast, you can keep them in your spell book. You don't have to prepare them on that day, and uh, mm-hmm. basically you just tell them like, "Hey guys, do you mind uh, waiting for ten minutes while I while I uh, check if there's magic in the area?" So it is very useful for wizards. So I can, uh, so they just I don't have to prepare them, right? Yes. So uh, you can add them to your spell book, and you won't have to prepare them for that day because you can add six spells to your spell book right now, and then mm-hmm. you can prepare four of them. So if you have a ritual spell, you do not need to put it in this four anymore. Okay. What and does con- you, can, you can prepare everything else. Yeah, Other and, than and those two. These two. What does concentration mean? Okay, great question. So concentration is a very specific... Or there's a co- some s- certain spells, they require concentration. And when you're concentrating on one spell, you cannot concentrate on another one. If you do, the first spell that you're concentrating on is gone. So for example, detect magic is concentration. Another concentration spell would be uh, like fog cloud. So if you're concentrating on detect magic and you cast fog cloud, detect magic is gone. So it becomes okay. very painful. Like if you cast, if like let's say you have hit the spell like hideous laughter on a target, the target that makes the target incapacitated and laughing uncontrollably, and then suddenly you decide you want you you want to give cover to your allies, so you drop a fog cloud. That the opponent who is incapacitated by hideous laughter can now stand up and can now take their because the spell is gone. Additionally, if you take any damage while concentrating on a spell, you have to make what's called a concentration check. And okay. if you do that, and uh, if you fail the concentration, the, the concentration check, you will also lose your concentration on the spell. Okay. When I cast mm-hmm. these ritual spells, yep. uh, do I cast them before like fights or after fights? No. Well, Not if it's during. a the ritual spells yeah well the casting time is uh if you cast it as a ritual it will take 10 minutes plus the casting time so the tech magic will take 10 minutes plus one action and in dnd one entire round is only six seconds yeah six seconds so okay. yeah you really cast it before <laughs> these are really good for Af- out of combat out of combat yes okay, okay. particularly find familiar because, because you can come into the game with a familiar already. You just declare it to your DM. And when you do that, uh, your familiar will be with you the entire game. Unless it dies, of course. But uh, the familiar is powerful. Like You can make it give you advantage on attack rolls. You can see through your familiar. And it uh, really helps you in a lot of situations, especially in combat. Does it cost a spell slot? If you cast it as a it ritual, it does money. not. <laughs> it's a ritual. It costs money, though. Yes, oh, it will cost you 10, yeah, 10 gold pieces, but oh, it's very fine. negligible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, lastly, what do you think of Thunder Wave? Thunder Wave is a very solid spell. It is really good if uh, you are surrounded by enemies. Because as a wizard, you are pretty squishy. There's a lot of spells that can instantly kill a level 1 wizard. So mm-hmm. Thunder Wave helps you get out of these really tough situations. It's a, uh, as DM Corgi mentioned earlier, it's an area of effect spell. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you choose, you create a 15 foot cube originating from you. 
And all those creatures will need to roll a certain number. That would be their constitution saving throw. If they don't mm-hmm. roll high enough, not only will they take 2d8 thunder damage, but they'll also be pushed 10 feet away from you. So this gives mm-hmm. you the opportunity to safely run away. Okay. Or shove a creature off of a cliff if you want to do that. That works too, yes. I've, I, I've done that and uh, broke a few mods by doing stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry? Could you say that again, DM Corgi? Yeah. Go ahead, um, you, if uh, if you use your thunder wave and they fail the save, they get pushed, mm-hmm. right? And what if they are standing on the ah, edge of a cliff? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <I know. laughs> tama, tama. So can I use this instead of the other? Um, what's the What's the first two that I chose? You chose Mag- uh, mage armor and shield. Yeah, and then magic missile and what's the other one? Chromatic orb. Yeah. Uh, which one is better between the three? Magic Missile, Chromatic Orb, or Thunder Both of them Wave? would be good. Actually, all three of them are good. It really depends on your play style. So, typically, here are the pros and cons. Here are the major pros of each. Magic Missile deals the least damage, but will mm-hmm. never miss. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, no. Yeah, actually, um, based on, on averages, Magic Missile will really deal the, no- the least damage, will never miss. It's really mm-hmm. useful if you're up against a spellcaster who's concentrating on a spell. Because Magic Missile launches three attack, uh, three darts. That means that the spellcaster will have to make three concentration checks if, they, if they're concentrating on something. So it's a great way to really break concentration. And it's an instant Magic hit. Missile. So it, ma- so it yeah. maximizes your damage. Sorry, Sorry about that. Magic Missile, Magic missile is also um, a way to hit those pesky enemies that are really tough to hit if they have mm-hmm. uh, like what the Bear said if they have AC 100,000 you can still yeah, hit them yeah. with magic missile okay. and magic missile has a range of 120 feet you can shoot That's someone from map. so far away <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yes but uh, again there's no such thing as a creature with 100,000 AC we're just <laughs> yeah <laughs> the highest I think okay. is like 30 AC that would be a Tarask if I'm not mistaken <laughs> but yeah so that's the major co- pro of Magic Missile. Chromatic Orb, a little less range, 90 feet. Not, uh, It's still a lot. It Among all, among the three options, Chromatic Orb will deal the most damage. And if you know a creature is resistant to a certain type of damage, like Acid, Cold, Fire, Lightning, you can still change the damage type. So Chromatic Orb ha- has that kind of benefit. Now, finally, for Thunder Wave, this also doesn't deal that much damage. But as DM Corgi mentioned, you can use uh, this is an opportunity to push an, a, a creature off a cliff. This is an opportunity to blast them away so you can run away. Um, all, all three of them would have their own uses. The mm-hmm. major con with Thunder Wave is that you'd have to be up close to your target because 15 foot cube originating from you, yeah. that means they're pretty close to you. But uh, all of them have their uses. It really depends on your play style. I'll go with Thunder Wave and Magic Missile. Okay. How's that okay. sound? Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. And for your rituals, uh, will you be getting uh, will you be getting Find Familiar and Detect Magic, or would you like to swap them out for something else? Um, do you recommend anything? Uh, this is just the two rit- uh, addition additional yeah. spells that I you know prepared. But if you have something to recommend, uh, I- I'd hear it. Actually, uh, those uh, the, your lineup is actually pretty good for spells because you have four spells to choose from. Two of the spells do not need to be prepared, so uh, mm-hmm. they'll, it's fine keeping them in your spell book. And these two spells, Detect Magic and Find Familiar, are things that you will really be using even in later levels. Okay. Would you like to lock them in? Um, yeah, yeah. Let's awesome. Do that. Okay, and remember... When you level up, you will be able to add two more spells into your spell book. So you still you can still learn all the other interesting spells. Some other okay. spells that I would recommend, but uh, maybe in later levels, would be like Feather Fall. So that if you like fall off a cliff, you can save your entire party. Uh, another in, uh, some other powerful ones would be personally my favorite would be like Tasha's Hideous Laughter, where you. What I do is I tell the opponent a very corny joke, and if they fail their wish save, they just fall down laughing the entire time. 
<laughs> That's interesting. It's like a control spell. It is. Like, there's just one time, just sharing a story. On one of my very first games in a convention, I ran up to the BBEG. The BBEG was just so powerful. He knocked, uh, She knocked down the uh, majority of the party. It was only me and another squishy person left uh, standing. And we. I only had one spell slot left. I ran over to the BBEG and shouted, Hey, what do you call a fake noodle? An impasta! <laughs> <laughs> I just fell over laughing. Gave me and my ally enough time to heal the rest of the party. And in an Avengers style manner, we killed them in one blow. <laughs> Ready action, attacked at all, at all at the same time. But uh, with only two slots, you really need to make sure that they're all maximized. So having your things like Mage Armor, things like Magic mm-hmm. Missile, which are will 100% maximize your spell slot, that is always going to be a plus. Okay. Okay. So we have your spell slot. We forgot, sp- we forgot another yep. very fun spell to mess with. It's oh, called where? Grease. Oh, God. Grease? It's, uh, it's very shenanigansy. Yes, you make the floor slippery. That's Ooh. that's pretty much it. You make the floor slippery. Ah, uh, grease. Okay, uh, grease. This one. <laughs> the grease appears each year. Ah, Dexter- uh, dexterity save. There yeah. Recommended at later levels because uh, okay. yeah. it won't really maximize your spell slots at, uh, yep. at level <laughs> one. <laughs> but again, something to look at mm-hmm. later on. Okay. All right, so now we have six spells in your spell book. So we're going to choose four of them to add to your uh, to add to prepare. And remember, after a long rest, you can you can change it. So we don't okay. need to prepare your rituals. We'll because, just prepare yeah. everything else. But bear yeah. in mind that if it if you don't prepare these spells, that means you have to cast them as a ritual spell, because you can cast find familiar. Oh, sorry, you can cast detect magic, for example, uh, with a spell slot. That will only use one action, but since it's not prepared, it will have to cast. It, it will have to cost ten minutes plus an action. Plus an but action. That'll okay. Be fine. <laughs> okay. Got it. Now that that's done, let's go ahead and select your cantrips. So you can yeah. choose three cantrips. So I'll recommend first the damage dealing cantrips. The two ones that I would primarily recommend are Toll the Dead and Fireball. So Fireball. Uh, you launch an attack at a target very simple very plain mm-hmm. simple if it hits mm-hmm. you, they can take up to 10 damage 1d10 mm-hmm. fire damage 1D10. Mm-hmm. the second damage dealing spell would be Tall the Dead so you point at a creature and they have to make what's called a wisdom saving throw if they fail they will take 8 damage uh, uh, 1d8 damage now if they're already missing hit points that 1d8 changes to a 1d12 so both of them are good. Like Firebolt will deal up to up up to ten damage. Uh, you just have to beat their AC. Now mm-hmm. Tall the Dead, they have to make a Wisdom saving throw. So Tall the Dead is good if the opponent has a, has a high AC. Uh, Firebolt will work if they have a low AC. So okay. you want to get one, both, or none of. Uh, I recommend you get one of these fire uh, damage dealing spells, but you can get one or both of them. Hmm? Firebolt. All right, noted. So, Firebolt it is. So, next up, I would recommend one RP spell. So, this is something that can help you in certain situ- in uh in situations where you need to talk your way out of things. So, the first one I recommend is Presti Digitation. This is also known as the hardest spell the hardest spell to pronounce. <laughs> so, Presti Digitation you can get a lot of harmless sensory effects. So, like, you can uh, make a shower of sparks come out. You can uh, change the smell of a certain area. You can clean yourself after battle. So, it's really good for RP purposes. Like, if you're going to see the queen of a kingdom, you probably don't want to be all stained from the blood that you the, from the blood of your enemies, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Another really good one would be friends. Although this is uh, situ- this is a bit situational. For me, I personally love using this spell. You, uh, This thing does not require a save whatsoever. So, you uh, cast friends on someone. You have advantage on all charisma checks directed to that creature. So, if you want to lie to them, persuade them, and uh, anything is, anything is, any of those charisma checks are possible. And you'll have advantage over them. 
the creature will consider you as a uh, as a friend. So like if you're going to try to like get information from them, friends would be a nice spell to cast. The downside to this is that after one minute, they will know that they've been charmed and they might turn hostile. But it doesn't matter if you're gonna run away, right? <laughs> so which oh, one calls can out I, you? Can, hmm? yeah? can I use this d- during battle? Uh, you can, but uh, hold on. Let me just check this. Is there a... No, no, you can't because the creature cannot be hostile towards you. So this uh, prestidigitation and friends, these are cantrips that will help you outside battle. Outside battle. Okay, I'll do it, friends. Okay, noted. And the last one that I would rec- that I, w- I would recommend is a utility spell. So utility spells will help can help you in combat, but more often than not, it will help you out with the exploration side of D and D. So the best the best uh, utility spells, in my opinion, are Mage Hand and Message. So message, it's basically you point your finger at somebody and you can send them, a, you can whisper a message to them that they can hear mm-hmm. and they'll be able to respond. So it's very useful if you need to sneak a message, if you need to uh, to communicate with each other, uh, even though you're far, even though you're far away. That's go, that's really uh, useful, especially in dungeon crawls when you have to be very quiet. Mm-hmm. Next is Mage Hand. So you ever have those moments when you're in a dungeon, you're pretty sure there's a lot of traps everywhere, and there's a, there's a, yeah, there's yeah, a suspicious yeah, yeah. looking door in front of you. Mage Hand allows you to conjure a spectral hand that uh, floats up to the door and open it for you. So this is really great for diffusing traps because if the door is trapped, then your Mage Hand, your mage hand just, you can just reconjure your Mage Hand again. If it isn't trapped, then great, you just opened it for you. <laughs> can a Mage Hand carry or hold a specific item it can however it cannot carry more than 10 pounds and also what uh some new what some new players try doing is they care they make a mage hand carry like say a sword and they'll yeah. try to use them to attack that will not uh-huh. work though so a mage uh, hand is okay. only really good for like unlocking doors or uh moving something to another okay. place yeah okay okay can it push or yeah, can, hold can push pull uh it, as long as the object does not weigh more than 10 pounds it's fine and majority of things do weigh less than 10 pounds like if it's like a weapon um i think like 95 percent of all weapons weigh about five to eight pounds less than, okay <laughs> i'll go with mage hand awesome okay so we have those three cantrips all set and we have your spell your prepared spells now, let's go back to race and choose one last cantrip. Yay! <laughs> a free cantrip. Oh, yes, okay. you get that for being a high elf. Yeah. So, for, for this one, uh, what type of spell do you want? You can do something to help you in combat, exploration, or art. Combat. Combat. Okay, so you chose Fireball. So, my personal recommendations would be Toll the Dead, like we saw earlier. It is very useful. Another one would be Shocking Grasp. It's very useful if uh, your opponent is right in front of you. Because uh, if uh, you try to use uh, Firebolt while there's an enemy right beside you, you're going to have disadvantage on the attack rule. But if you use Frostbite, it's a melee attack. If you hit your target, they will lose their reaction. Meaning, you can attack them with with uh, shocking grasp, and you can run away, because uh, in D and D, if a, if you run away from a target who's right in front of you, you you will trigger what's called an attack of opportunity, meaning they get a free hit on you. So if you use shocking grasp yeah, on yeah, them, this, you yeah, run yeah, away. Opportunity attack. So that's a that's a pretty solid spell. So those are actually my two recommendations: uh, Call the Dead and Shocking Grasp. Shocking Grasp is good for melee. Toll the Dead is good if it's uh, if an enemy is already missing hit points, you can deal even more damage. And what's nice is they are different types of damage. So if you're up against an enemy that has resistance or immunity to fire, Shocking Grasp or Toll the Dead will should work perfectly. Um, I'm not sure. You know, um, is Ray of Frost available? Ray I- of Frost, yes, that is absolutely available. 
So Ray of Frost uh, deals 1d8 cold damage and the target speed is reduced by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. So most creatures only have 30 feet movement. With Ray of Frost, you can reduce it to 20 feet. 20. It only deals mm-hmm. 1d8 damage, so that's personally the reason why I don't recommend it. But if, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, d- again, it depends on your playstyle. Uh, Ray of Frost can also be a very solid spell. Yeah, because I have already uh, damage, uh, regular damage spells. I would, I was thinking of something controlling. It's either Ray mm. of Frost or to, to, what's that? Toll, Toll of the Dead. The dead? Toll the Dead. Uh, actually, if that... what, what does it do again? What what's the um, additional damage it does? If it's already missing any hit points, the, instead of dealing one d eight necrotic, it will deal one d twelve necrotic. Necrotic. What does yes. necrotic do at the beginning? Um, of it's just the... it's just a different type of damage. So like cold, fire, those two are different types of damage. Necrotic is also a different type of damage. And it does one d twelve if the the if, if the enemy is already damaged. Yep, that's right. Okay, I'll go with that. Okay, nice. Okay, so we have that set up. Let's go back to your description now. And going back to your character's backstory, they are they want to learn more about magic and the multiverse and want to explore the rest of the world. So mm-hmm. we now have the chance to choose languages. So there's a lot of different languages here. I'm just gonna go ahead and give recommendations, unless you have a. But if you have like, no. <laughs> one particular language you want to learn, uh, just let me know. So no, you can hmm? choose any language. Awesome. So you have. So you know how to speak Elvish and Common. I recommend mm-hmm. since your character is a type that really wants to learn different types of different types of magic, different types of uh, cultures. I would recommend mm-hmm. getting more exotic languages. So. Perhaps uh, Draconic, so being the language of dragons. Are you good with it? Okay. Sure. Next, uh, Infernal Magic. Let's say your character is a person who wants, who's willing to make packs with devils to learn more deta- to, to learn more things and become more powerful. Would you like to learn Infernal? Sure. Perfect. Sure. Draconic and Infernal. Yes. And one last extra language. I would recommend... Uh. Primordial. This is the elemental language. So kind of okay. kind of a nice throwback to Jace the the planeswalker from Magic the Gathering. Because element mm-hmm. elements. <laughs> yep. Go. Oh, let's do awesome. that. Awesome. So that is everything. We have your your stats all set up. Let's now go to your equipment. So equipment. You have a quarter staff or a dagger. You probably won't need to use these. I would recommend that you get a dagger just in case. But uh, again, you're probably never going to use it because you have to. Yeah. You want to save your attacks with. <laughs> you want to use spells for your attacks. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, what do you Go want to dagger. use to cast your spells? Like uh, Harry Potter has a wand. Do you want to cast it from like your necklace, from like an orb, or the theory can be anything. So, what's your version of a wand? It can also be a wand uh, if you want. No, no. I'll, I'll I'll go with an orb. Got you. And the orb can be like it can be attached to your it can be attached to a necklace or it can be a crystal ball that you're holding. Uh, any it, it's up to your creativity. Okay. So next, you get a certain type of pack. Uh, since you are a sage, we'll give you a scholar's pack. These give you a lot of flavor items that really won't help you out in game, but it's just nice to have for RP purposes. Okay. All right, and for. Uh, more things to add to your backstory. You come with, you come in with a ba- bottle of ink, a quill, a small knife, a letter from a dead colleague posing a question that you have not yet been able to answer, a set of common clothes, okay. and 10 gold pieces. So we have all that set up. Let's go to your character sheet now. So over here in your character sheet, I am going to uh, equip everything. And I'll give you control over this in a, in a bit. So okay. here is your character. So remember, at the start of the game, you want to save one of your spell slots for Mage Armor. This will bump yep. up your yep. AC to 16. So you just have to manually remember it, or you can just uh, manually change it over here. All right, so you can put here... So that's for eight armor. hours? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. The beginning of the mod. 
cast it already. Yeah. And then just change here additional magic bonus, add plus three because that's your dex modifier. And then add mm-hmm. here mage armor. But let's remove that for now so that uh, we don't get confused later on. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay. So you have your damage dealing spells. Told it fire. You want to use fireball as often as po- as often as possible if the target mm-hmm. is not missing hit points. Mm-hmm. And you want to use Stall the Dead if they're already missing hit points. Because there's a chance that they will take 1d12 instead of 1d8. Okay. Okay. And uh, that basically, that's it for being a level 1 wizard. Uh, best advice is try not to die. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carl, do you have any questions for playing a wizard? Um, no question. Uh, Fantastic. How, how do I get... Will you send this to me privately? Yes, or? I will. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and post it over at hashtag claim your character. So let me post the link. Hold on. Here at Discord? Yep. Um, claim your character here. Okay. Yep. I'm posting the, the link in a bit. Uh, so there's seven, five. Yeah, I think that's the code. So yeah, I sent the link. It should look like this. So you just go ahead okay. and scroll down to Carl's character, and then scroll all the way to the click Carl's character, scroll down to the bottom, and click join with his character. After that, it'll transfer over to your D&D Beyond account. Okay, great. All right. So thank you so much, uh, Carl, for joining. Yes, uh, DM Corky. May I, may I add something? Of course. Since uh, someone's bringing a wizard, one of the best parts about the wizard is... Yes, you uh, are able to add spells to your spellbook every time you level up. But Mm -hmm. whenever you encounter a wizard in your party, or if you find a spellbook or a spell scroll while you're out adventuring, you Mm -hmm. can do something called um, copying spells. You can add more spells to your book, which means the wizard can have the opportunity to have so many, so many, so many spells to choose from. Uh, And that's what makes them special. They're the ones that can have access to the most spells. And if you're lucky enough you to encounter other wizards, you can say, Hi, wizard party mate. Can we copy spells later after the game? And if you find a spell mm. scroll or a spell book while adventuring, DM, I'm, I'm a wizard. Can I please have this book? Or can I please have this scroll? <laughs> you can... And if, it's, uh, if, it's, if the scroll is, a, is a, of a spell on your spell list as a wizard, you'll be able to copy it into your spell book. Without yes. leveling um, up? Without leveling up, um, gotta catch them all. Gotta catch them all. Spellbook. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> but uh, okay. it does Perfect. cost a little bit though, because you have to spend. Uh, I believe it. DM Corgi, please correct me if I'm wrong. But it is. Uh, it is uh, one downtime per level of per spell level, and fifty gold pieces. Is that right, DM Corgi? One hour and fifty gold pieces per spell, per level of spell that you're copying. Yes, so, but because, uh, if um, it's downtime, if it's downtime, it's one hour. So if you you can build up to a, a, an entire day's worth of downtime with a lot of spells there, but it's very expensive. Like in real life, D and D education is very expensive. <laughs> That's yep, why yep, uh, yep. being a wizard, being a wizard, you will always be broke. That's why uh, a lot of wizards <laughs> that I know are very cheap. I don't want to pay for I don't want to pay for this potion. I'd rather pay for my education. <laughs> I, I, who, cares, who cares about Who cares about uh, quality of living in my apartment i just need i need my education education is expensive <laughs> okay thanks for the tip i'll keep yes. that in mind and uh, i'll look for more spells so yes uh wizards in my opinion are the most complicated class but once you get the hang of it it's also one of the most rewarding like especially when you're on a table with another wizard you're suddenly best mm-hmm. friends by the end of the mod <laughs> Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, they are they are squishy for a reason because if you allow them to grow stronger, they become the game breaker class. Um, yeah, I have true. yet to, I have yet to be proven wrong, but if you allow a wizard to go up to level I don't know fourteen and beyond, you suddenly are a god. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially at the, especially in tier four where you can literally shift reality with your powers. That's oh, why. Nice. That's why a lot of wizards don't live that long because they are dangerous <laughs> when they when they are. They are the target. Yes. Okay. Uh, Got it. Uh, you would often encounter uh, if, if you're encountering a party of smart enemies, they'll say kill the wizard first, especially mm-hmm. at higher levels. 
mm-hmm. um, you would, they will go for the spellcasters because you guys are that dangerous at higher yeah. levels if you live that long. Yeah. Just a sure DM, one story. DM bear will, yeah. will make me live longer. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, just Don't share kill one me last on story. Saturday. <laughs> Sharing one story. This is a tier three game. A wizard saw the BBEG. It was a very powerful creature. He casted Force Cage, and the BBEG had no way of getting out. So they basically just went in, stole the loot, and then. Uh, Just ran away. The, the BBEG had no way of fighting, so uh, he was a bard. So he got. He was also part bard. So he just started singing this song. Fuck this shit, I'm out. Mm-mm. Fuck this shit, I'm out. <laughs> no thanks. So yeah, wizards can be very game breaking. But yeah. in the long uh, run, mm-hmm. do wizards have counter spells? Yes, they do. At level five, they can un- unlock counter spells. Okay, got it. That's, okay, uh, thank you, DM Bear. And- DM Corgi. All right, thank you so much, Carl, and welcome to the D and D world. Yay! The AL world, rather. <laughs> yep, yep. Thank okay. you. My pleasure. All right, thank you so much, Carl, and thank you so much, DM Corgi, for helping out with character creation. We now move on to our second to our second uh, student today. Jellofish 16 is currently not here, so let's go on to Hector. Hector, are you with us? Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hector. How are you doing today? <clears throat> doing fine. Still doing work in the background, but I can do this in the meantime. Awesome. Oh God, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, that's kind of a thing. Like usually, when I run, when I'm running games, a lot of the players are like, "Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm just doing. I- I'm just uh, alt tabbing and measuring my work up all. You know, <laughs> yeah. first of work from home. <laughs> yeah. Someone messed up. The, the systems this morning we, oh, we just fixed it today like one hour ago I'm finishing all the reports oh my I'm God. supposed to be on leave I'm to be... <sighs> that's a, another so problem bad. with work from home life <laughs> all right, there well... is no leave <laughs> well I'm glad that you had that, that you have time to join us for character creation and we're happy to have you so Carl yeah. uh, let me ask you what got you interested in D&D Actually, uh, full disclosure, um, I'm playing a game on another server, uh, Ooh, Dudes cool. and Dice Tavao. Dudes and Dice! Oh my god, I love Dudes and Dice. I yeah, just came I'm from doing, their event yesterday. I'm doing Eberron there. Uh, mm-hmm. And and because the, the tables about to get close, so the DM is going to do something for life, life, life mm-hmm. thing. So... So we call this a chance to get into standard because everyone characters can't translate into mm-hmm. standard AL exactly. if I understand correctly. That's right. So, so this is my chance. Like, like, because when we did character creation, though, it was you know everyone only. So mm-hmm. I want to learn how to to like do it in standard. I want to do a different class this time. Ah, uh, I see, I see. But yeah, I totally love the dudes at Dice community. They're so friendly. Um, <laughs> I know, right? I just came. <laughs> I I ran two games in ArcherCon yesterday. And ah, yeah. it's so much fun. Yeah, I ran Devil King High School and the Way Stop for Dudes and Dice. <laughs> yeah, they did have a they did have a Valentine's Day thing happen. Yeah. Oh, also while we're talking about events, uh, shameless plug, Tabletop Lounge is also running their own event on February 28. I'm signed up actually. Oh, cool! Awesome. Looking table forward. three. Awesome. Are you also playing their Eberron game? That's our table one, I believe, with DM Johnny. Uh, no. I, I, my Eberron character is cursed in Roll20. I wasted <laughs> I wasted 8 DM in space to miss on all on, on an ability check. So I'm retiring my Eberron character when the game stops. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No worries. No worries. <laughs> okay. So you're playing... So uh, you're creating a new historic character. Uh, can you... Yep. Uh, What playstyle do you plan on having? Uh, for this one, I think because in the other one I was a I I am a multi-class fighter warlock. Ooh, so nice. hexblade, uh, fiend. Oh, nice, nice, nice. All right, go on. So so this time I wanna, you know, um, probably some somewhere in the realm of because I find myself going down so much. Like <laughs> this time I want to be someone who wants to bring someone back to so either a paladin or a cleric. I'm not sure which one fits more because mm. I, I still want to be able to to hit but i want to be able to to like give life or to myself or to others like keep the party alive a bit longer oh all right all right cool cool, cool. Uh, yeah go on uh, 
this guy is signed up for my game. Oh, yes. awesome! Yeah, DM Corky uh, is play, is gonna be is gonna be your DM. DM Corky will try not to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I keep hearing that from DMs, but they keep trying to anyway. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't unless I know. I don't unless you're in tier three and you and you uh g- genuinely antagonize the bad guys. Oh, For yeah. example, um, you you insulted his mother. Of course, they're gonna try to kill you. But if you're just if they're just there to survive, they're probably just gonna you know fight and then run away if they want. <laughs> uh, whatever, just it's it's like real life. It's be like trying to keep it realistic. Um, if you are a douche to the NPCs, they will they will try to kill you. But if they're just you know there for whatever, you can even convince them to stop fighting. Sorry. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and um, you mentioned <clears throat> you mentioned bringing people back from the dead and being able to deal good enough damage. Um, yeah. There um, there is of course the paladin, but they are very they are very um, good in good at fighting and good at bringing people back. However, the you mentioned bringing people back. Uh, I can't help but I can't help but feel a soft a soft spot for clerics. Clerics are high up there on my list of uh, favorite classes, and um, clerics are also devastating on the battlefield. If you if you tell me that clerics are only good for healing, I will uh, <laughs> come to you and I will steal your socks because clerics are not just good for healing. They are also devastating. If you bring yes. a party of, if you bring a party of two cleric, two or three clerics, in a group of five, the bad guys are just gonna, uh, they're just gonna choose <laughs> to give up. Um, if you if you want a, a cleric that's good at fighting and healing, I can't help but feel my bias. This, I'm already telling you, this is my bias. Um, the g- grave domain cleric, uh, Mr. Bear can tell you all about it and see maybe that's what you want. <laughs> yeah, actually, the Corgi's sales pitch is very strong. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I would also recommend clerics because cleric. Um, for a long time, clerics uh, were seen as a support class, but it's common knowledge now clerics are not a support class because their damage output can be pretty high, especially once they get to like level five and they cast uh, spirit guardians. That's amazing DPS that. It's a it's good battlefield control. Being a and they can uh, basically they can keep somebody from dying from so many times. Like um, I played a cleric once, and I went through the me and my entire party went through the entire battle taking like zero damage, literally zero. <laughs> and wow. yeah, they they can really uh, clerics have for most of the damage types. Uh, personally, I think that clerics deal more. Uh, better with DPS, especially once they put down their spirit guardians. But clerics can get really annoying as a DM. <laughs> Personally, like um, if I have a cleric, they're the first person I target just because I know that they are the ones that are keeping their team alive. But they're also very hard to kill. <laughs> <laughs> I so, think I'm sold. Okay. <laughs> I think Actually, I'm sold. I think I'll be a cleric. <laughs> Actually, uh, DM Corky, you mind helping me out with this one? Because I really only have one cleric character, so I think you'll be able to sure. help out here better. <laughs> so first clerics. off, we have the Divine Domain. But before we get onto that, let's go choose a race. So uh, for new players, I personally recommend going for human because humans are the easiest to use. They're the most versatile and uh, they don't have any abilities that they need to activate. But since you have a bit of background with Eberron, uh, I think you can choose a different class. Uh, I think you can choose a different class, which one, a different race rather, whichever calls out to you more. Do you have a particular race in mind that you want to use? Hmm, for clerics, uh, I was thinking, cause I want, I want someone, I want something with a very strong, like, like, I like uh, proficiencies for like, uh, concept. Proficiency Constitution or something like that. I was thinking, like uh, a dwarf Gosh. cleric or like or like a, a dragonborn cleric with like resistances. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, actually, dragonborns, uh, depending on the type of <laughs> form they have, they depending on what type of dragonborn they are, they will have resistance to certain types of damage. For the proficiencies, uh, for the ability score increases rather. 
uh, these can actually be changed because uh, as of last month, I believe, uh, you're now allowed to customize your ability score increases. So you can change hmm. this to something that will help you with the cleric. So okay. I would totally recommend Dragonborn. Uh, Dragonborn cleric sounds cool. They have a breath weapon and that damage resistance can be powerful in certain mods. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's it. Dragonborn cleric. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, uh, you said you want to have a bonus to Constitution and to Wisdom. So, let me just adjust this. Uh, hold yeah. On. Adjusting customized origin. This is actually a feature like I only learned about recently. <laughs> okay, so we have your origin increase. You can choose to increase on ability score by one. Let's increase your wisdom. And let's increase your constitution. Draconic Ancestry. Uh, what type of resistance do you want? Do you want... Uh, oh, sorry. Resistance? I think mm-hmm. in general. In general. Like... Uh, in general, I think... Fire damage. Fire. Like maybe a red, red dragonborn then. Red dragonborn. All right. So you can launch a 15 foot cone for a for that fire damage. Okay. And you have your damage resistance and a breath weapon. So that's gonna be really awesome at later levels. <laughs> okay, so uh for the divine domain, I'll turn you over to DM Corgi. DM Corgi, uh um uh yeah, please take the floor. Uh sure. The clerics are uh, the cleric is a very good class in a way that you can be fo- more focused on damaging, more focusing on healing, more focusing on exploration and utility. They are uh, they are the class with one of the most numbers of uh, subclasses available next to the wizard, and um, you can go whichever direction that you want. And each of them has their own unique set of features depending on your playstyle. Uh, if you want, you said you want to be someone who's good at hurting people and good at healing people. Um, I already stated my bias, the grave domain. Um, but if you want to be more, on a, more if you want to do more offense, as in uh, with martial weapon offense, you can go for the war domain. If you want to be someone who's good at um, defense, you, not gonna lie, you can also go for the uh, what's the word domain? The forge, forge domain. Uh, uh, so let me summarize each one. The Forge Domain is the blacksmith's blacksmith's blacksmith. Um, the War Domain is the is the um, it's like a budget it's like a budget paladin, but more focused, but more opportunities to be a good healer because of that. And they are also good at helping others hit better, um, certain number of times a day, of course. Uh, there's also the 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 grave domain. Uh, they say um, I summarize this class into it's not your time to die. <laughs> you, um, you don't have my permission to die. Stay alive. And they see a bad guy. I think it's your permission to die. Let me guide you to your doom. <laughs> and then uh, and uh, so it's a matter of uh, the kind of play style you feel suits you better. If you see the other um, if you see the other cleric domains here uh feel free to point one out and i'll tell you more about it whichever piques your interest that two i would like to know more about the death and the tempest domains okay the death domain unfortunately is only available is is available from the dungeon master's guide they are what i call the edgy cleric uh, okay. The edgy cleric in such a way that uh, they are they are fascinated with them and then they use it. Um, it's only available from the dungeon master's guide, and unfortunately, if you're making an, a brand new AL character now, you won't be able to use that. Okay. The um, what was the other one? The tempest, tempest. domain. Tempest domain. You're basically Thor, because uh, they use the power of the elements around you um, to <clears throat> to. Um, Crush their allies and help their and help their friends. Not gonna lie, it's also one of the it's also one of the best damage dealing clerics on the list. If you want to go Tempest, be my guest. It sounds it's a good solid option as well. If you want, hmm. I think so, I will buy into the. I think I'll buy into the bias. Grave domain. 
Alright. And we'll buy into the Vaya. Sweet. Congratulations, uh, DM Corky, yes. for recruiting more oh. Grave Domain. Yes, my uh, the, 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 uh, the IRL persuasion worked. Nice. Uh, okay. Um, the Grave Domain is uh, at first level, you have something called the Circle of Mortality. Uh, you it, it grants you the, a free cantrip called Spare the Dying. If you see a friend dying on the battlefield, bleeding to death, so they're at zero hit points and they have to make their death saving throws, you can say, nope, you're stable. I stabilized your condition. The beauty of it is, grave clerics can do this as a bonus action and can do it from 30 feet. What? Normally, normally you have to be next to them and you have to use it as an action. But grave clerics, gra- gra- grave clerics get to do this as a bonus action from 30 feet. As a bonus action, um, oh, they useful. also, they also, in addition to that, when you heal a creature with your magic who is down, you don't need to roll the dice. It's you; they heal the max of that dice. For example, my friend is down. I healing word them instead of rolling one d four plus wisdom. They just heal four plus wisdom. It's just it's 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 a. That's why a lot of uh, a lot of grave clerics, myself included, say, "You're not down. I'm not gonna heal you yet. It's cool." Or, <laughs> or, or, um, um, now is not the time. I'm gonna do this for. I'm gonna do this first. Uh, so you can choose to be that. That's one of the. That's the level. That's at level one, by the way. That's, that's level, level one. That's level one, by the way. Yeah. The max oh. heal. That, max heal. When how, is that, down. how is that fair at level one? I mean, it's it, it was approved and published in a book. I'm not gonna complain. I'm just gonna enjoy it. Uh, yeah. They also have something called Eyes of the Grave. It's funny that you mentioned the Paladin because they have something called Divine Sense. The Grave Cleric has kind of like that, but it's limited to undead. Because they are the subclass, the subclass, the domain of clerics that are that really dislike undead, according uh, according to the lore. But you can choose to flavor it that way, whatever. It's a, it's a character creation thing that is up entirely up to you. Uh, so the eyes of the grave is you you open your senses and you can can find uh, undead up to a certain number of feet, etc. 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 Sixty feet, oh. not behind total cover, if I remember correctly. Etc. Etc. So you right. become a radar for undead specifically. That's Whoa. at level. That's at level one. Level that's two is where a... level two is where you get the very very juicy bit. Um, they uh, clerics have a divine, a channel divinity feature. Um, and for the and other than the turn undead, where you present your holy symbol, the undeads within thirty feet have to make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, they have to run away from you. No choice. You can. That's a good way to control the battlefield, because once they're turned away from you, they'll stay turned for an entire minute, un- or until they until you damage them. Uh, so it's a good way to control the battlefield. Like, um, guys, we need to go here, but there are so many bad guys, many undead zom- There are many zombies after us. So yeah, I'll use my channel divinity to turn them away, so that we can have a, a chance to escape. That's one. The great every cleric has that. Uh, but the grave domain has something called path to the grave, um, where wherein you choose a bad guy and you bring them even closer to death. The next time they are hit with an attack, they become vulnerable to it. Meaning, if you have a rogue or a paladin or something like that, uh, you curse your enemy, the BBEG, with path to the grave. And the next time that your rogue companion hits them, or a paladin, your paladin companion hits them, one attack, the damage out, the damage from that attack times two. Whoa! So so imagine that with a rogue sneak attack, or a pla- paladin's divine smite, and if right. they crit, and if right. they, and if they crit, uh, essentially, essentially, uh, they roll their crit dice, and whatever the total is, times two. Right. I wow. I have I have witnessed something beautiful a lot years ago. I was spectating a game, pre-COVID IRL. <coughs> I, I saw I saw someone in the table. They had a paladin. They had a grave cleric, and I saw that the paladin crit. They, they dealt two hundred seventy-five so and so damage. <laughs> one hit, <laughs> one hit, one hit. So I wow. saw my friend. I saw my friend take out all the dice that they had. On their person, and they had to roll it again because that's just so, so much damage. And it was 
Mwah, chef's gifts. One of the best things ever. Uh, Personally, so, just to interject, like I had one of my yeah. glorious moments a while back. I was playing a divination wizard and I rolled a 20 on my portent. Meaning that mm. I could use that 20 on any die roll in the future. So at the BBEG, mm. uh, a grave we had a glaive cleric who used Path to the Grave. We had a rogue with we, sorry, we had a paladin with his with his divine smite with, with his max level divine smite. He launched it forward and I was like, wait, it's a crit. Not 20. The damage output was oh. amazing. It was a one hit delete and knocked and killed out BBEG in one turn. So yeah, right? Path of the Grave is so powerful because like, right? Uh, crit with a with a divine smite with vulnerability that is so powerful. <laughs> right? It's it's funny because it's not, you don't even have to just give that to your allies. You can give it to yourself. I'll tell a story. I was in a party of four. Uh, we had a we had a diviner. We had a redemption paladin. And the role play of this redemption paladin is they avoid hitting things at, as much as possible, which I don't mind. Uh, because that's the role play of this person. So I, I I got the BBEG with Path to the Grave. And I said to the paladin, I look at the paladin and I say, do, do you want me to take this for you? Then the paladin says, yes, please. And so there there I was. I looked at the wizard and I say, uh, can I have that? Uh, can I have that portent? The wizard said, hell yeah. So here I am, uh, Grave Cleric. I cast inflict wounds at uh, level eight. Oh my god! Um, and um, it's it becomes a crit plus vulnerability. Um, uh, I think I, I I just exploded the BBEG, and uh, <laughs> so it kind of pro it kind of proves that it's not just the your allies can be bolstered; you can bolster yourself because inflict wounds is an attack roll spell, so it technically counts as the it's it clar it uh, qualifies for path to the grave. So imagine a cleric dealing. 200 plus in one in, 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 with one attack and uh it's 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 nuts and it's beautiful and it's satisfying uh and um uh yeah path to the grave that's just second level by the way imagine all the beauty imagine the beauty of this when you're at higher levels when you can do so many more things um uh, i i get excited whenever i meet someone who makes a Grave cleric, I tell them, oh, I can't wait to, s I can't wait for you to be able to do this and to do that and to do this and to do that. Second level, by the way. <laughs> Second level, when you get yes. to sixth level. Oh ah. my God! Wait, let's not get too ahead of ourselves, because like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. clerics are amazing at uh, almost every level. They get, they get uh, something very powerful. But yeah, yeah um, before we get way to, before we. Uh, delve too far into the later levels. Let's wrap up mm. our ability scores. So, uh, cleric, they primary they get their power from their wisdom because that's how much they know their connection to their deities. Now, you mentioned that you wanted a bonus to constitution as well, which is great for maintaining your concentration checks. So, my yep. personal recommendation is keeping wisdom as your highest and constitution as your second highest. But, uh, okay. can you... Uh, can I ask you to rank these from highest to lowest? And DM Corgi, uh, if you can give any recommendations, that would be great as well. Hmm, I'll let uh, I'll let the player decide first, and then we'll see where it goes. Hold on. So I guess one moment. One moment. So I guess yeah. I guess wisdom is first, constitution second, then. I would say mm -hmm. charisma, strength, intelligence, and dexterity in that decreasing order. Okay. All right. Any feedback, DM Corgi? I mean, sure. Why not? Because uh, um, uh, clerics, people forget that clerics have proficiency in charisma saving throws, which means it's very nice for them to have uh, a decent amount of charisma to go with it. Sure, go ahead. And constitution is really great for a spellcaster, especially if you are going to be, for example, concentrating on a lot of things. You can't cast spells if you're dead. You can't concentrate on spells if you're dead. You can't heal yep. your allies if you're dead. Um, that's uh, that's the philosophy that I follow for all of my characters, more so for the spellcasters. Um, 
there's also there's also the matter of uh but there's also a matter of your um physical stats uh because grave clerics they are not good with heavy armor they do medium armor which can be bolstered with a with a higher dexterity oh. you can make you can perhaps you can perhaps uh, flatten out flatten out your strength or something something but that's entirely up to you it's just that the grave clerics use medium armor so if you have a for, if, for example you have half plate uh that can be at that can be bolstered with your dexterity uh which Ooh. for up up to up to, up to plus two in dexterity so that's if that's a thing that will factor in go right ahead okay i think i'll <clears throat> yeah. take that advice and switch dexterity and strength actually right. if i can make a recommendation I would put mm-hmm. dexterity at thirteen, strength at eight, and charisma at uh, and charisma at uh, twelve. That way, if you have a thirteen dexterity, it gives you more opportunities to multiclass if you want to go down that road later on. But again, that's not mm. uh, too essential because uh, because at uh, how do you put this? Because an, an AL, you can change everything about your character until your first level 5 game. But if you, I would personally recommend putting your dexterity higher so that you have, uh, so that uh, you, can, you get a bonus to your AC. And you can always just okay. use ranged weapons for your attacks. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so good, let's do that. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So dexterity, we'll put that at 13. Your strength will be at, uh, sorry, did I get that right? Well, okay. Uh, no, I think mm-hmm. yeah. charisma over strength. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, I was just testing you. Good job, you passed. <laughs> you were listening. <laughs> All right. So we do have one odd number here, but that's fine because you can get feats later on to flatten that out to a 14. And uh, you, you need at least a 13 to multi-class. So I think this will be fine for you. So we have that set up. Let's go over to your background. So... Uh, do you have a backstory in mind for your character? Mainly, why did they become an adventurer? Yeah. Uh, so basically, um, my character was a uh, was a roving adventurer. So he used to, you know, he used to do stuff with an, another party before, but then the party got wiped out completely by this super high level BBEG that they were not ready for. So he escaped barely and made his way to a monastery where he licked his wounds. While he was there, he learned the ways of the monastery, and then he decided to dedicate his life to that. And then, but remembering his old friends, so parang he's like an old soldier. Mm, all right, great. So I have two. Uh, I have two backgrounds that I can recommend. So the first one would be soldier. So you came from a, if you came from the army, you suffer a bit of PTSD <laughs> from uh, from fight from getting into a fight and seeing all your allies die. That's a good archetype to go on. Another one that I can recommend would be the haunted one. So this is more of like you want if you want to have if if you want to have like a sworn enemy type of uh, storyline. So where is that haunted hmm. one? Is it the haunted one? I think it's H. Yeah, H. H. <laughs> so haunted one is a cool. It's a good. It's another good archetype. So basically, you were with your army. You were all really close with each other, and. You were sent, sent to slay this powerful creature. It can be a demon, a devil, an elemental of sorts. And basically, in a traumatizing event, your entire party was wiped out. Now, you've devoted your entire life to hunting down the creature that now haunts your dreams. So, Soldier yeah. or Haunted One, both of them would fit your story pretty well. Which one calls out I, to you the most? I think the Haunted One. Awesome. It's like, it's like a, a different take on it. Awesome, awesome. All right, I so mean, please, they, oh, yeah, go on. They both, spell, they both spell PTSD on a character, and I, I think it suits the, the concept that the that Hector said. Um, the haunted one in particular, because when people look at you in the eye, they can tell that you've been through some stuff. Right. <laughs> so yeah, uh, can you go ahead and choose two skill proficiencies here? Uh, or- I guess survival, because he came from a battlefield, and then the other one probably would be. Our religion, because you know he's now dedicated his life to the cause. I see survival right. and religion. Awesome, awesome. Just to clarify, survival deals more with like tracking or surviving in the wilds. So very good for your character. But uh, um, some players come in thinking that survi- 
having proficiency in survival will like give you more hit points or so. Hmm. It doesn't work that way. It's mostly like Bear Grylls survival. Are you good with that though? Uh, hold on. Survival. Because I was thinking like traps in this army. No, that's more rogue skill. That would uh, be perception. It... Or investigation. Let's make it investigation na lang. Alright. Great, great, great. So religion. You know the opposite of religion? Religion. Mm. <laughs> Okay, that was a corny joke. Anyway, going on. Right. <laughs> so we're going to cleric now. Uh, you already have your proficiency in religion. Uh, can you choose history, insight, medicine, persuasion? Go ahead and choose one. Uh, I guess proficiency in insight. Okay, you know the opposite of insight? Outside. Good job! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next uh, one. Uh, in here or something like that. In here? <laughs> yeah, well, put it in. Inside. Or put it in, put it in blind. In what? In blind. Because it's outside, so no sight. Blind. Never mind. It's a cornier joke. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm totally stealing those next time. All right. So if you have history, medicine, persuasion. Uh, let's go for medicine. Yeah, medicine. Okay. No, no, no. Oh. People alive, eh? Let's do history. Okay. So, naman, pwede her story. <laughs> okay. That's na yan, that's na yan, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, as a grave cleric, you have you have uh, two prepared spells. There's Bane and False Life. False Life b- gives you additional temporary hit points. And one cool thing about temporary hit points is that these are not your actual hit points. So, when you cast False Life, you gain 1d4 plus 4 temporary hit points. That's a maximum of 8. If you take damage and it drains your temporary hit points while you are concentrating on a spell, you don't need to make constitution saving throws to maintain concentration on your check on your spell. Because it's not your actual hit points. It's like a kind of like a buffer. <laughs> right. So that's super useful. Uh, so for spells, I'll turn you over once more to DM Corgi because she's more familiar with this. Uh, go ahead, DM. Uh, sweet. Okay, so you're looking at spells, right? You want yep. to be someone who uh, boosts your ally, bolsters your allies. Um, so you you can't deny a good um, a good healing spell will be great, such as uh, the classic cure wounds or healing word, since this is first level. There's also if you want to be someone who protects an ally, or if you want to be someone who who are who is good at uh, protecting your allies by protecting yourself, you can't go wrong with sanctuary, because um, sanctuary will force your enemies to make a wisdom saving throw before they harm you in any way, such as attacking or casting a spell that targets only you. Mm. Uh, so that's really in the end the nice part about Sanctuary you can cast it on someone else for example there's an NPC you need to protect and they they will be hiding somewhere or they're in, you're in the middle of the battlefield trying to protect them you can Sanctuary the the NPC or maybe a party member who who needs to stay alive or maybe yourself because well you're the healer uh, one sharing one story with Sanctuary. I was playing a life cleric and I had an AC of 18, pretty high level. It was level one at that time. Ran straight forward to the BBEG, cast Sanctuary on myself, action dodge. So they have to make a whiz save just to try to attack me. And even if they do attack me, they attack at disadvantage. So that decrease we went through the entire battle without taking any damage at all because i was tanking and they weren't able to land a single hit on me so sanctuary is really solid spell especially if you don't plan on dealing damage (laughs) exactly and um instead of dodging you can say help action you can help your allies get advantage on attacking while protecting yourself even if you are in the thick of battle so sanctuary is pretty good if you're trying to protect buff there's all and if but if you want higher armor class, there's always shield of faith. However, it's concentration. Mm. It, it's uh, you increase um, someone's armor class, include or yourself by two. Mm. Uh, as long as you, for as long as you're concentrating on it, so it's right. a nice buff spell. If you're if you have uh, a designated tank in the party that you're gonna send to the front lines, you, maybe maybe shield of faith is good because sanctuary. Is not concentration, but it wears off the moment you do something violent 
such as casting a harmful spell or attacking. So, yeah. if but of course you can't give that to your barbarian if they're out there hitting everything. So <laughs> maybe maybe shield of faith would be good or bless. Bless uh, increases your likelihood to succeed um, saving throws and attack rolls. Add the one d four to your to hit, and then and the one d four to your saving throw. It's a uh, it it can uh, it can be granted to three creatures, yourself included, if you want. Uh, so I ha- uh, it's also up there in my highly recommended spells, because I'm pretty sure as a cleric, okay, sure, let's get healing. That's why I'm not suggesting the healing, because I'm pretty sure you will get that. <laughs> what I'm suggesting what I'm suggesting is other things other than the healing spells. Mm, I see. Yeah. How many spells can I have? You can yes. have four. Can have four, correct? Four, okay. Up to four. I will, I will take bless. Mm-hmm. Sanctuary sounds nice. Okay. Uh, I'll have uh, healing word. Healing word, nice. And guiding bolt. Guiding bolt. Oh, so. yeah. I was actually just about to recommend guiding bolt as well because. The damage output of Guiding Bolt is powerful. 1d4, uh, sorry, 4d6 radiant damage. That's a maximum of uh, 24 damage at level 1 and grants advantage to the next attack against it. So, Guiding Bolt is a yep. really solid spell. Good so, choice on that one. That's what it, it, and every cleric can have access to these spells, further proving the point that clerics are not just dedicated healers. It's totally. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, they're. And there's also inflict wounds if you're gonna attack in melee. So if you want to go for that, you may do so. But guiding bolt is a solid choice as well, especially since it has a range of 120 feet. It can uh, you can take down uh, you can take down a BBG from far away using guiding bolt. So that's really really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cantrip sex, uh, DM Corgi. Cantrip sex. Like we already sex. have R four. Dragonborn do not have um, dark vision light. <laughs> because, okay. yeah. because uh, as a spellcaster, if you deprive yourself of dark vision, you're you're depriving yourself of more opportunities to cast spells that require sight. You yes. can't cast spells on a target that you need to see if you can't see. So, as right. a dragonborn with no dark vision, I highly recommend getting light. I just okay. want to share a story that happened in one of my IRL games recently in Tabletop Lounge. I was DMing for a party of four. They were in Avernus. They had to infiltrate this very well-protected base. All of them were humans. None of them had light. And it was completely dark because it's only devils there. Devils have devil sight, so they can see in the dark. Actually, one of them was a one of them was an elf, so he had dark vision. And he, he unfortunately he was a monk. The other three were humans. They were carrying two items. They, all their attacks required using two hands. So unfortunately, the squishy monk was the only person who had a free hand. He was he was assigned as the torch bearer. So a lot Ooh. of the combat involved focus firing that monk just so that I could get get rid of that torch. <laughs> it was the first time I saw a monk tank, but it was so much That's- fun. And it's a moral of the story. Get light. You need it if you don't if you, if you don't have dark vision. <laughs> so that's that's your utility. Uh, there's also the support cantrip called guidance or resistance. Um, guidance grants uh, free one d four to an ability check. So if someone needs to pick a lock, uh, guidance. Uh, you add the one the they add the one d four to their pick to their lock picking check. Mm. Uh, resistance is the same as guidance, but for a saving throw. For example, you're sending someone in to set off a trap, but they don't have they don't have a way to set it to set it off by other than activating it. So so uh, disarming traps with their health, basically. Uh, right. You can give them resistance so that they add a one d four to their saving throw, so that the, the the pain will not be as devastating to them. That's your support. That's your support cantrips. There's also the of offense cantrips such as sacred flame, toll the dead. Um, you, I think you were listening in earlier. So, Toll the yep. Dead uh, is good for uh, is good against um, damaging bad guys. Uh, even more so if they're already damaged. Sacred Flame um, is pretty much the same, but 
but it uh, instead of necrotic damage, it does radiant damage. If you need a source of instant radiant damage and you don't have spell slots for guiding bolt, you can't deny sacred flame is pretty good. Okay, how many cantrips can I have? I have three. three. I guess I will take uh, light, spare the dying, and I guess. Uh, oh. And <clears throat> I... oh, uh, spare the dying as a grave cleric. You already have it. You don't need to get I... it. Anymore. Okay, so it's that's, already. That's the beauty of it. It's a it's a bonus spell mm. that you have access to. Okay, so that so that in that case, I will take light, uh, guiding, and. And I guess Sacred Flame. Sacred Flame. Note it. All right. Yeah. One advice I want to give, by the way, for guidance is cast it before, like, uh, try to project and anticipate what's going to happen right. next. Like, um, if you're entering a creepy-looking cave, uh, go. I would recommend casting guidance, even though nothing has happened yet. Because the duration okay. of guidance is one minute. And if you oh. encounter one of those very rare moments when somebody is on guidance and the DM says roll initiative, you can actually use guidance for your initiative to, to add a bonus to your initiative. Yep. But remember, you have. Is... Sorry, go on. It's an ability check. It uh, is an ability initiative... check, yeah. Ability, ability check. So that's good to have. But you'll have to, it's going to be one of those rare moments when a character is already under the influence of guidance when the DM says roll initiative. So it's really great if you can anticipate when uh, a character is going to get into danger. So uh, yeah, just cast guidance when you can. It's a cantrip, so no spell slots. <laughs> it's free. Yeah. Um, since you're since this is gonna be Adventurous League, you will have the opportunity to rebuild if you wanna try other things. Uh, a nice utility spell to have is also Thaumaturgy. It's yeah. a free megaphone, essentially. You can cause your voice to become louder if you wanna say, Hey guys, I'm over here and from like a hundred feet away or whatever. Uh, okay. it's a good way to boom your voice and to make a minor sensory effects as well, Thaumaturgy. Yeah. And um Mending, it's it's very utility heavy and uh, rarely used. But when it's when it when the opportunity arises, it's so useful. For example, somebody broke their something. You can you can cast mending. It costs it takes one minute to cast, but it will allow you to repair objects. Not broken limbs. I'm sorry, but <laughs> um, but a broken a broken vase, a broken shirt, whatever. Right. So it's very very utility. If you Sadly, it cannot heal oh. a broken heart. Oh. <laughs> uh, what can uh, heal a broken heart is therapy. And unfortunately, um, <laughs> it's not accessible at level one unless you, ha unless you have uh, some strange magic with you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So with that done, let's go wrap up your character. So you, as a dragonborn, you speak draconic and common. We can now choose one exotic language. So you've devoted your entire life towards hunting down that thing that killed your your allies. Now, going on to your backstory, what is that thing that killed you and turned you into a hunted one? I think it would have to be something demonic, something something way above our league. Like 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 maybe I don't have a creature. My recommendations a... would be abyssal, that's dem that's demons. Infernal, yeah, yeah. those are devils. Deep speech, that is... Uh, aliens. Not, aliens, like aberrations, mind flayers, those are cool. Um, or primordials, these are elementals. Those are my four recommendations. I think it will be more abyssal. Abyssal, demons, got you. All right, and That's one other language that you picked up on your travels. So, um, we can add to like a backstory. Like, um, one of the people that died was your... Was your partner or your best friend? Uh, that person could could have been an elf. That's why you know how to speak elvish or a dwarf. Right. That's why I know how to speak dwarfish. So, um, what was so? Uh, what was the race of one of your best friends or your partner in combat? I think one of my partners in combat was a. Uh, a like, probably. A very very weird orc paladin. 
orc. Like an orc, orc paladin yeah. devoted to the house of uh, devoted to Bahamut, something like that. Nice. So that orc was your partner in the in during your, in your party, and you've gone so close to them that you know how to speak orc. And after they were slain, you devoted your entire life to being a demon hunter. Nice. Right. Yes. Let's go now to your equipment. So, uh, for your melee weapon, we, you can only choose a mace. Uh, right. You can choose scale mail. I believe that's medium armor. Although this will give you disadvantage on stealth checks. Uh, or you can choose uh, leather armor, which will give you a little less AC, but no disadvantage on stealth. Which one would you prefer? I think... I think... I think I prefer the AC scale meal. Yes, nice. That's a good call. As DM Corgi mentioned, uh, you cannot do any healing if you are dead. <laughs> yep. Okay, so we'll give you a light crossbow since you have higher dexterity than strength. Yep. And we can give you a... Uh, since you are a haunted one, we'll give you an explorer's pack. So these give you a bunch of flavor items that won't really help you out in the game. Next up, we'll give you a shield and a holy symbol. What do you use to cast your spells? So if Harry Potter has a wand, what's what's your version of a wand? I think uh, I've chosen like like a like I've asked a priest to bless like a piece of broken sword. Like that's a holy mm-hmm. symbol for me. Like I've asked a priest to bless. Like it's it's covered in cloth, but it's like a broken sword from one of the orc paladin's broken ah, sword. Like one nice. Of the Love it, love it, love it. I've asked a priest to bless it, so it's now the holy symbol. <laughs> okay. Now for one of my favorite <laughs> things to do. Uh, choose a num- Please choose a number for between 1 to 100. 74. 74. Okay, let's see what random item you start off with. 74. 74. You find a fan that when unfolded shows a sleeping cat. Aww. So this probably be- belong to your orc friend. The cat's name is uh, can be whatever you want. I would recommend something like uh, Mr. Snuffles or Pudding. So that is something that belonged to your orc friend. Yeah, he like to call it. He like to call it Megadeth or something. Megadeth. Got you. Got you. <laughs> All right. Let's add that to your character. And now let's equip everything. Let me just add that fan that shows a sleeping cat. I think that's the first sure. time that came out. <laughs> Is that there... from the PHB trinkets? Yep. Ah, nice. One like fun one. Like, uh, mm-hmm. I was doing a character creation for another person before, and her character was a sailor. That It just so happened that the trinket that she got was a clockwork goldfish. And it played... Oh, she, she attached it to her character so well. Like, she had to sacrifice something that meant so much to her. She gave up the clockwork goldfish, and it was like such a heartbreaking moment for everyone at the party. Just so happens, in the very next adventure, the uh, one of the NPCs would give them three random trinkets. It just so happened, one out of one hundred chance, a, the clockwork goldfish came back up. <laughs> so she was so happy, like she actually screamed IRL that she got their clockwork goldfish back because she felt kind of uh, empty without it. So she went through the entire. Since level one, she had that goldfish with her. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Yes. All right. So I'm uh, gonna put everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If if uh, if we're talking trinkets, I also include, especially since we're the, uh, this character is using the haunted one background. I also include on the possible list trinkets from Princess of the Apocalypse and trinkets from Curse of Strahd, because the trinkets there are also really cute and really really cool. <laughs> I think they are also valid options. So maybe you'd like to check them out as well in the future if ever someone wants to make yeah, a sure. character and they happen to have a trinket. That's cool. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, an example trinket is like a palm-sized stone with a hole in it. And every time you put the stone to your ear, you hear a whispering wind. Uh, so it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so cool. And so it's so flavorful. Doesn't do anything, but it adds personality to your character. And it's just mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah. It's really cool like when you get a trinket that really adds to your character. <laughs> All right. Yes. So, Hector, your char- here's basically what your character does at level 1. As much as possible, you want to you want to attack your creatures. Actually, uh DM Corgi wants to tell him how he can fight uh, how to how to play a level 1 cleric. Uh, I'm not too proficient with clerics. 
<laughs> oh well, um, if uh, clerics are a good choice of class in a way that they can become support and combat in a pinch if you need them to be. So uh, it depends on that what kind of situation that you're in when you're playing a cleric. Uh, <clears throat> if you see that you're surround, you have party mates that are very good fight uh, fighters already. Like if you're if you're with a bunch of rogues, a fight fighters, barbarians, etc. You can sit back and say, okay, I'll be support this time. But if you see that you're also you've also got some party members who are more for more for support. Um, or more for uh, bolstering you as well. You uh, and you feel that there's not enough damage dealers. You can adjust and you can be, you can be a damage dealer. You can get into the thick of it, not too maybe in melee or maybe almost melee. Uh, so that's the beauty of it. You adjust depending on your party. You can tr- you can tweak your play style, but if you want to be full on support, protect m- must protect, must boost, must heal. Then that's completely, totally fine. Uh, you can, if you see that there's a need, you can bolster them with bless. Or if you see that the bad guys seem rather dangerous, that you'd rather debuff them, you can you can cast bane on them. I think that is a spell that you already automatically mm-hmm. get because you are a grave cleric. Um, so you can either bolster your allies or debuff your enemies, it's... and then and then adjust from there but more often than not once you select one stick to it so if you want to, if you choose to debuff that's cool uh and then you can if you but if you need to you can choose to buff your allies i uh, highly recommend staying close enough to close enough to them you don't have to necessarily be in the front lines but clo- within close enough distance to all of them so that if you need to um uh, if you need to you can spread the dying spread the dying spread the dying spread the dying because 30 feet, that's a good safe distance to be from your allies. Because if you're and too far, you can't heal. Yeah. That's why clerics are also one of the most lovable classes. Because they silang nag adjust. Right? <laughs> Hashtag who got. Right. So, yes, that's the, like, that's the life of a cleric. Uh, damage dealing, supporting, utility. Clerics are all around, and your party will absolutely love you for keeping them all alive. So, uh, really Hector, good. do you have any questions for DM Corgi today before we I turn over the character to you? Uh, I think I'll chat her because Rule 20 is one of my weaknesses. I hate Rule 20 so uh, hard to use. <laughs> Don't worry, there's a bit of a learning curve there. Uh, most of the time, it just eats up a lot of bandwidth. In that case, mm. uh, the DMs don't normally don't really blame the character. They normally blame PLDT and Converge. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, um, anytime you need uh, assistance, you can always hop on over to hashtag uh, o- over here on our server, hashtag character help. You can also... Yep. I also have uh, there's also this co- this place called Cool D and D Servers, which is over here on the Discord server. I'm gonna add DM Corgi's Discord server here as well. She also does character creation tutorials, which is always so amazing. And uh, shameless plug on DM Corgi's uh, DM Corgi's runs. She has a Kofi link where you can give donations. She also makes these amazing D and D borders. I'll show mine in a bit, but. Uh, she made these custom Roll20 borders for me. So now all my tokens look are really like uh, bear cave themed. So I'm so happy with them. <laughs> thank you again, DM Corgi. So yeah, Hector, thank you so much for hopping on to character creation. If you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to message to, to, to send us a message. Thanks, Hector. Sure. Thanks. Have a good day. You too, you too. <laughs> All right, so that was Hector, and now we're gonna move on to our next person, Mad Hatter twelve oh three. Are you with us today? Hi. Hi, Hi, Mad Hatter. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I'm just fending off my cat at the moment from ah, the yes. character creation one. <laughs> he's a lovely, he's a li- lovely ginger pirate cat, but you know, cats being cats. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. The cats are just like uh lie down on your computer while you're in mid game and they'll be like, "Oh, I'm sorry. Were you were you doing something?" <laughs> oh yeah. I, he even does that at, when I'm doing work. Ah, God. Oh. All right. Awesome, awesome. So Mad Hatter, uh we'll get to your character in a bit, but first off, but but before we go on, uh let me just uh pause this for like for like uh 2 minutes. I just need to go grab something. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, BRB, in the meantime, one of our spectator DMs, uh, Nadi Lanetti here, will sing for you all. Uh, take it away, Nadi. Come on. <laughs> Sample, sample, sample. <laughs> I'm driving. Oh, ingat. <laughs> Thank you. I forgot to ask Mr. Bear kung ilan yung nakapila. I think somebody was asking if they could add another person to the list. I think. Or was that just uh, was that my imagination? Uh, DM. Um, so yes. after me, there's one more. Um, so I'm not sure the other one wasn't here. I think at the time. So hmm. third one. There's just one more today. Ah, after okay. mine. After me. Okay. Cool. Anyway, uh, if Hector, if Hector's still here. Uh, if he, if Hector has Roll Twenty questions, just feel free to message me. I Roll Twenty Roll Twenty sucks if you're forcing yourself to learn it by yourself, but it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot easier if you have uh, someone who knows how to use it helping you to use it. Um, Definitely okay. I will. Yeah. I will reach out. Hey, um, sorry, DM. Yeah. Just one yeah. DM, Corgi. Uh, just one more question. You've ever made maps in Roll Twenty? Um, I think I've only ran a game where there once, and I've had the hardest of times to actually make a map. Hmm. Scratch. Honest, Mr. Mr. Bear, Mr. Bear is uh creates maps. Um, you can look at his oh. Patreon. He create he makes maps, D and D maps, and uh, yep. some of them are some of them are free, I think, but some of them are yeah, for the pa patrons only. Filipino mods. Yes, locals. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, well, I can also show you how to set up a Roll20 map uh, without having to be a professional um, TRPG cartographer. Uh, I can also I can also do that. Or if Mr. Bear is, uh, cool. is available to do so, he can also let help you out. Maybe when he gets back, you can ask him. Thanks. Sige, DM Corgi, I will reach out. <laughs> Kasi yeah. in my Eberron game, God, Roll20, hirap nila pa ako maglagay mm -hmm. ng mga arrows. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, right. I, I, I too had a hard time learning Roll20 alone. So it took me a while. But but um, it I only got motivated to learn more about it nung quarantine. And uh, I had right. friends... Quarantine. I, I had friends who are good with it, who know how to use it, and then they showed me some tips and tricks and uh, some uh, hacks, uh, big brain smart hacks, so that uh, setting up a map is easy, and um, preparing NPCs and um, such and such and such and such and such, etc. etc. And then uh, um, after after learning all of that, I, I was all, damn, this is a lot easier than I thought. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, while we're on that, uh, I, I'm just going to show you this cool feature here. Uh, with when you Once you claim your character on D&D &D Beyond, you have access to the D&D &D Academy's resources on D&D &D Beyond. Legendary Bundle has already been unlocked. So if you want to, you can actually view everything. Let me just open that. You can actually view all of the adventures and all of the source books, all unlocked for content sharing. So once you claim your character, you'll have access to all of this. Best part, it's 100% free! Yay! <laughs> so feel free to browse it, to, to browse around it. And once you do that, I'll also post a link to an extension called Beyond 20. So this will unlock this awesome red die over here. So let's say I'm attacking with Hector's character. If I want to cast Guiding Bolt, I just have to click this. This red die will pop out. And once I do, boom! It pops out on roll 20. Why are you like... There you go. You rolled a 9. That already includes all of the dice roll, the modifier, and the damage. So makes it 100% super easy. And if mm -hmm. you hop onto my personal server on cool DND servers, you'll see the Mr. Bear's DND cavern. You log in, you'll also 
uh, see a link there for my custom maps. Uh, currently, all of my maps for mods made in the Philippines are for are free to download. So you, if you want to DM a Philippine-made ma uh, map, uh, sorry, uh, if you want to DM a mod by uh, Philippine writers, mainly uh, the mods made by Paul Gabat, you can download them for free, set them up on Roll20 real easy, and uh, yeah, it makes the D&D experience so much easier. Also, shout out to DM Corgi, who also makes custom borders. So the borders look really awesome. Let me just uh, flash one of the ones that I made. So this is what it looks like. So this is for a flesh golem. Look at that. Looks so, it looks so nice with the, with the cave background and all. <laughs> so yeah, that was the shameless plug for today. So uh, uh, before we left, b before we went on break, we had Mad Hatter on. We had Mad Hatter who was currently handling an IRL tabaxi, uh, ho hopping onto the computer. <laughs> Mad Hatter, how are you doing? I'm doing okay now. He's playing in a box, so I'm just letting Perfect. him be for now. For some reason, cats really love boxes. So, <laughs> but um, with uh, since you since you mentioned your cat, by any chance, do you happen to play a tabax, or would you be playing a tabaxi by any chance, cat folk? Um, no, I think I've <laughs> I think I've created the character about it once, but I've never really played them. Oh, I see, I see. Well, yeah, just uh, another shameless plug. One of the DMs who will be DMing in our event on Feb 28 is DM Koshka. Uh, oh my god, he has the best tabaxi characters of all time. Anybody who's played with DM Koshka uh, as a player, is, uh, they always have the time of their lives. He has the most adorable tabaxi-themed characters. Uh <laughs> DM Koshka will be running Rumors of Riches at 8 p.m. during our event on Feb 28. If any of our spectators want to join the event and sign up for DM Koshka's table, he has like, amazing RP skills. Uh, entrance fee registration for the event is only 140 pesos. You get to play all of the games lined up for that day, and you will receive a, a gift certificate worth two hours of gameplay in tabletop lounges physical location. In addition, it will also give you a chance to win raffle prizes from our amazing sponsors in uh, Hey Meepling, Wild Magic Gaming Oddities, and Daisuke, along with a membership in Mr. Bear's, D Mr. Bear's Cavern. That's my personal server. Yay! <laughs> so you can find more details about this over at a Grand Adventure online event on our Discord server. But for now, we have our character creation tutorial. Mad Hatter, thank you for waiting. So, uh, what type of playstyle did you have in mind, Mad Hatter? Oh, do you have a nickname, by the way? Or do you prefer just go with uh, Mad Hatter? Um, Mad Hatter's fine. Mad Hatter, awesome. Hatter, if you really want to show it. Hatter, all right. <laughs> yeah. So, Mad Hatter, what type of playstyle? Uh, before we go on to the playstyle, uh, what got you into D&D? &D? Um, it, it, um, it was one of our friends... Uh, Asking if we wanted to uh, learn and set up, learn the game. Mm -hmm. uh, that was around three or four years ago. Oh wow! And awesome. from then on, um, I've played some of the modules, Pandalver, mm -hmm. um, and we have because of the pandemic, we never finished um, Tomb of Annihilation. Mm -hmm. Just one, oh I God. think, one last session left. Oh uh, my God! Wow! Final one. Been... Please no spoilers. <laughs> You would have been one of the rare people to live through Tomb of Annihilation. I've heard so many traumatic stories of uh, that dungeon crawl. But uh, yeah, there are a lot of people yes. here who got into D&D &D mainly during the pandemic because of the whole stay-at-home thing. So welcome back to the D&D &D universe! Yay! <laughs> Thanks. All right, so... Since you played with a group of friends, am I correct to assume that this is going to be your first AL legal character? Yes. Awesome. Yes, this is my first. Uh... Awesome, awesome. AL is so much fun to play with, especially like if you want to play like every day. You don't have a specific group as dedicated as you. Um, you can play at any time with different people, different DMs, and it won't affect the overall story. So, uh, Hatter. What uh, type of character do you want, or like what type of playstyle do you envision yourself using? 
Well, I w- initially was thinking um, a spellcaster utility, but mm-hmm. um, since we've already had the wonders of a wizard, and I already played a warlock, mm-hmm. I actually wanted to go for and they play a barbarian in Tomb of Annihilation, at least mm-hmm. the second one. So I wanted to try another melee character. Oh, melee that's character. not really a monk. <laughs> not a monk, though. Okay, so. For melee characters, what do you plan on using? Uh, oh, rather. Actually, if you want to play a melee character that's really focused on damage dealing, my two recommendations would be Fighter and Rogue. So a Fighter ha- is, is, has a lot of uh, customization op- uh, options. You can, play, you can play as like a two-weapon fighting with like a one weapon and a shield or a very heavy weapon. Fighters are powerful at dishing out, making a lot of attacks in one turn. So that is one cool way of using a fighter. Another option is a rogue. Although rogues are normally seen as characters who have uh, who use ranged weapons, the Sword Coast Adventures Guide allows you to use a swashbuckler. So a swashbuckler has a lot of mobility. They can, they focus on hit and run tactics. Rogues are really good for people who love to who love to focus on positioning and love maximizing the control of the battlefield. So both of them are really cool. Uh, rogues typically f- uh, focus on dealing one very powerful attack, while fighters focus on dealing a bunch of attacks. But both of them are really cool classes to use. Which one calls out to you the most? Uh, fighter. Fighter, awesome. So let's go ahead and select Fighter. So you mentioned that you've been playing D&D for a while. You with uh, Tomb of Annihilation. So uh, do you have a class in mind? Or would you like a recommendation? Um, I think a recommendation. Because um, I played with the I played with a Dwarf for one game. Mm-hmm. I'm currently playing a Goliath Barbarian. Ooh. So I, I know there are a lot of... Um, other classes I've never tried before yet. Awesome. So, uh, what type of weapon do you plan on using as a fighter? So, you can get something that's like two hands for the max for like uh, max damage output. There's uh, one that th- there's a type of weapon that gives you reach options, so you can attack from ten feet away. You can use two wep- two weapon fighting, so you're holding two short swords. All of them are really solid. Uh, which one would really call out to you the most? Um, considering the backstory of my um, char- the character I'm thinking right now, um, mm-hmm. Reach should be should be in his ter- in his um, territory. Reach. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So my two recommendations for you: the first one would be Human Variant. So a lot of people are kind of on edge. Of, a lot of new characters, rather, are on edge about choosing Human because it's kind of basic, but. The human variant is so cool because they start off the game with one feat. And if you plan on using Reach, having the feat called Pole Arm Master is so cool. You can attack a creature once they enter your re- your range. You can uh, you can make a second attack using your bonus action called uh, uh, by attacking with the butt end of your pole arm, and it allows you a lot of control. And at later levels, you can combine it with another feature called Sentinel, where you at, where if you attack somebody, their rain their speed drops to zero. So that is so powerful. Imagine hitting somebody from ten feet away, taking taking uh, one step back. At the start of their turn, if they try to move closer to you, you hit them again. They can't move. They're done for that round. It's oh. a very devastating combo. If I may, mm-hmm. yeah, because sure, uh, because a lot of people really like the variant human. Mm-hmm. And yes, it is great because feats are great. But um, but there are also other races that might appeal to you. For example, mm-hmm. if you would like to pick a half orc, they have yes. something called they have something called savage attacks. Wherein if you roll a crit, if you roll a crit, you roll your dice for crit, and you roll another, which makes you a heavier damage dealer. And half orcs have a thing called relentless endurance. You get reduced to zero hit points. You choose to get back up instead. Assuming the attack doesn't, uh, assuming the damage doesn't kill you outright, 
Um, meaning that yes, you keep getting hit, you keep getting hit, but you can choose to get back up again. But that only that only works for long rest. But it's still an opportunity for you to have that clutch moment mm-hmm. where you're beaten down, bruised, bloodied, battered, with one HP remaining, and you make the heroic final blow against the bad guy in defiance. So it it adds to your survivability as a fighter if you are gonna be right in the thick of it, and um, uh, you can uh, also what do you call this um, benefit from things like I don't know dark vision because mm-hmm. humans do not have dark vision. <laughs> yes, you have a feet, you have a feet, but you can't see in the dark. That's still if if you are if you're a player that is concerned with being able to see in the dark, especially since you are a combatant. If you can't see what you're attacking, you're not going to be as effective of a combatant. So that's another option to think about. Uh, and um, you mentioned you mentioned um, attacking from afar, dealing uh, dealing heavy damage. You already and you also mentioned the Goliath. N- the, not gonna lie, they are also a good option. But I think you're already familiar with um, the Goliath. So if you want to go some go somewhere else beyond. Um, the variant human. There are the other races to consider, but if but of course the draw of a feat is so powerful that of course of most likely you're gonna say yes to it anyway. <laughs> I'm just there's just lots of other options yes. if you if you find it more appealing. Another option that I could recommend would be bugbear because uh, of course as the uh, Mister Bear, I am inclined to recommend bugbear whenever I can. <laughs> uh, one cool thing about bugbears is they have long limbs. Meaning, when they make a melee attack on their turn, their reach is extended by five. So you can, with your with your pole arm, you can attack somebody from fifteen feet away. So that is huge control. So aside from that, they also have this ability called surprise attack. So if you surprise a creature and hit it with an attack on your first turn in combat, your attack deals two d six damage, an additional two d six damage. So it's like a free sneak attack. This pairs well with your with your proficiency in stealth, which you get for being a bugbear. So those are actually those are three uh, races that I would happily that DM Corky and I would happily recommend: a uh, human variant for the free feet, the half orc for the savage attacks and relentless endurance, and uh, and bugbear for that extra range. Those are all very powerful. Which one calls out to you the most, Hatter? Um, as much as I'd like the feet, um, I've never played the orc or half orc before. Ooh. I'll take the half orc. Nice. Half orcs are very solid, and yeah, I think they're definitely gonna be happy with that with uh, your half orc build. So we have that set up. Now let's. I don't think we need to modify any of the bonuses because plus two to strength and plus one to constitution are really solid for uh for a fighter build. So before we get into the details of what your class provides, let's go on to your abilities. So, I need you to rank these from highest to lowest, and we'll modify it afterwards. So what would you choose as your highest? Um, I was thinking uh, strength, constitution, dexterity, um, and charisma, wisdom, and well, of course, last on the intelligence. Okay, nice, nice, nice. Welcome to the 8 Int Gang! Personally, I love having, I love having eight in characters because uh, they're so much fun to RP. <laughs> All right. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the odd numbers because odd numbers do not increase your modifier, and it's the modifier that we're mm-hmm. after. So let's lower your right. strength by one. You notice that your modifier still stays at plus three. Dexterity lower mm-hmm. by one. Constitution lower by one as well. This gives you five points to play around with. And in the point by system, uh, getting to 14 or 15 will cost you two points instead of just one. But yes, somebody uh, right. want to say something? Yeah, go on. All right. Uh, oh. Yeah. Uh, so one thing is you can't increase your strength any anymore. You can't lower your intelligence by anything else. So you can dev- you can move your five points to any to a uh, dexterity to charisma. What would you like to increase? Well, I reckon because of the back story, let's mm-hmm. let's. Well, I hate I, this. Isn't going to be an int intelligence. I'm afraid. Let's increase this uh, int a bit. Okay. So if we can reach it at ten, it's fine. Then... The eight int gang will miss you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I guess if we can spend some of the points left for wisdom. 
Wisdom. Okay. This would be solid because wis- because the most common saving throw in D&D is Wiz Saves. But I should give you a warn- fair wa- uh, small warning though that uh, if you increase your Wisdom, you will have one point left over that you will not be able to use. But that's fine because you can still add it to another... Uh, to uh, to another class in case you want to multi-class later on. So, would you like to increase it to wisdom? Would you like to add it to wisdom? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, hmm? mm. Now, you'll have yeah, one point left over. You can add it to wisdom or charisma, and uh, it will be at an odd number, meaning that you won't be able to maximize that point. But that's fine, if you want, especially if you want to uh, increase, if you want to multi-class later on. If you add it to wisdom, that gives you the opportunity to multi-class into monk or monk, cleric, or druid. If you want to add it to charisma, it gives you the opportunity to multi-class into bard, uh, sorcerer, or warlock. Or paladin, because or his paladin, strength right, is at right, least right. a 13. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, charisma. Charisma. Nice, nice, nice. Actually, a fighter paladin would be would really be a powerful build. <laughs> okay, so we have that all set up. Now let's go to your description. I'm very excited to hear your backstory. What do you have in mind? Well, um, so the character I'm thinking about, he's actually a farmer slash baker in his hometown. Mm-hmm. And he, while he loves his parents very much, he decided to go on an adventure because he's actually looking for ingredients. Um, seeing the world, he's never been out of the mm-hmm. of his... Um, he's never been out of his... Um, town before but he's just basically looking for ingredients to improve his bread making skills cool awesome awesome all right oh so, so... you're in japan yeah yeah <laughs> 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 I've had too many edgy character backstories already. I wanted something wholesome this time around. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So you came from you're you came from a family of bakers, and you are a very uh, popular and very skilled baker, a uh, master baker, if you will. And as a master ba- uh, as a master baker, you want to go outside the forgotten realms and look for new ingredients and new baking techniques. So, yeah, there are some cool backstories that we can use. So, the first one that I would recommend would be the Far Traveler. So, as a Far Traveler, you come from a faraway land that nobody has really heard of before. People are always excited to hear about your tales. Another one would be uh, would be Hermit. So, a person who lived in isolation. So, there could be like... You are come. You came from a small tribe or come from a small village that hasn't really seen the outside world, similar to far travel. But as a hermit, you live uh, entirely alone or with in a in a very isolated society, and this has given you time to really hone your skills. So maybe the products that you that you that you dish out are very different from what you normally see. The last one that I can recommend is the Outlander. So an outlander is somebody who has come away, who is away from civilization. So all those three are fairly similar. But what calls out to you more? Um, DM Mr. Outlander. Bear. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, DM. Pardon? Sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry. Uh, just to add, um, since you are, since your character is a baker, you would like to find a way to get to contact other bakers so that you learn about their, oh, yeah. you uh, learn your craft sure. better. I would recommend something called the guild mm-hmm. artisan, where you spe- you specialize in a certain kind of uh, craft, and you you get you build can establish connections with other people similar of similar similar to your uh, skill set. And maybe you can get in touch with them, learn from learn from them, get access to get access to um, ingredients, equipment, and maybe through the connection that you have with your guild artisan, you might be able to secure an audience with, for example, a famous noble who is interested in trying in trying your food and ha- can hire you as a baker or a caterer. So if it, if it's if it's if that matches your backstory, you can also go with that. It's <laughs> big guild artisan. Yeah, Guild artisan, in hindsight, guild artisan would actually make match your character much better. Thank you so much, DM Corgi. <laughs> All right. So, um, as a guild artisan, you are proficient with insight and persuasion, as we've learned from the pre- from previous uh, from previous students. Uh, insight is the opposite of outside, 
and persuasion is the opposite of persuasion. <laughs> okay, going on to the class features now. Let's go choose your proficiency. So you have proficiency in insight and persuasion. Choose two fighter skills that you can be proficient in. Uh, take, you can't choose insight anymore because you've already chosen it. And if you need a clarification on what one of them does, just let us know. Actually, I would think um, perception because he needs to make sure that every piece of bread is um, to his standards. Yes. <laughs> and um, I would say athletics because you can't just, when you're making things like bread or pasta, it's really requires some strength into it yeah that's true that's true <laughs> all right so next we're gonna choose your fighting style since you want to use pole arms i believe the best one for you would be great weapon fighting so when you're holding a melee weapon with two hands like a pole arm if you roll a one or a two on a damage die you can re-roll that so uh it potentially increases the chances of you getting the maximum damage so great weapon fighting will pair very well with your character. So your final ability as a level 1 fighter is second win. So as a bonus action, you can you can gain 1d10 plus your fighter level. So it's very good in clutch situations. And this can happen once per short or long rest. So we have that set up. Uh let's go now back to your to your description here. Okay, so you have one artisan tool. I I suppose that would be a cook's utensils, since you're a baker. Okay, awesome. And we can choose one language. So uh, personally, I think that if you are a baker, you would deal with uh, mostly like uh, with mostly. I'm not sure if it's really part of their lore, but for some reason, I always envision halflings as ideal cooks and bakers. Maybe if you want to use alcohol involved in your baking skills, maybe you have a lot of dwarvish staff. Uh, and if if you don't want any of those, I elvish is all, elves are very common races, so I would recommend dwarvish, dwarvish, halfling, elvish, and actually also gnomish. So those are the four that I would recommend. But uh, if you have any other language you want to learn, go ahead. Uh, Hatter, you're on mute, if ever. Sorry, that's my cat. The cat stepped on the... <laughs> the cat stepped on the mute button. I'm really sorry. Um, Let's go with something Pay weird. To me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, he's asking me for food already. It's oh fe His feeding time's like 5 o'clock. He does this every time. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with something weird. And let's go primordial. Primordial, all right. So one thing that I have to let you know, though, when it comes to languages, they have to be tied into your backstory. Oh my God, somebody sent a mm -hmm. picture of pizza. Sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> Thanks, Liam Corky. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so if you're going to learn Primordial, uh, perhaps tied in with your backstory is that your, your baked goods come from nature. So Primordials are elementals. So... Uh, perhaps it's the prim it's training with the primordial uh, in a very uh, you watch that uh, anime Shokugeki no Soma um, I've heard of it never watched yeah. it sadly. so one thing that so it's a basically it's a it's a school for chefs and uh, one thing about that is they teach you how to cook in very unique ways so perhaps you've been you're uh, you learned primordial so you could communicate with elementals to show the different ways you can get baked goods or ingredients from nature. So, sound good? Ah. Awesome. All right. And now let's go for your equipment. Uh, let me just open this GIF sent by DM Corgi. I think this really Perfect. fits what's happening right now. <laughs> yes. So, I got distracted with the pizza. Looks so good. I'm hungry now. All right. Uh, let's go with your equipment. So since you will be in the brunt of combat, I, uh, let's grab you some chain mail, and we're going to get you two martial weapons. Since you're holding a two-handed weapon, you can't carry a shield. So let's grab your pole arm. So do you want a lance, halberd, or glaive? Um, halberd. Halberd. Awesome. 
and we can get you a second martial weapon just in case the first one gets broken or corroded. So which one would you what what what, what second weapon would you prefer? Be awkward to hold two weapons, so maybe a short sword. Short sword. Um, sorry, it, hmm? yeah, just a backup. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, next we since you have pretty high dex, uh, let's get you a two hand access in case you need to shoot something that's a little far. And two hand access will use your strength. Since you are looking for new ingredients, let's get you your explorer's pack. And mm-hmm. you have proficiency in cook's tools. Let's get you cook's utensils. You also have a letter of introduction from your guild, a set of traveler's clothes, and a pouch containing 15 gold pieces. So actually, that sums up your character. But uh, let's see what your ca- what your fighter will look like at later levels. At level 2, you will unlock the very powerful Action Surge. This allows you to attack. Uh, you can use your Action Surge. It doesn't require an action or a bonus action. So very powerful. Giving you an additional action right off the bat. You will feel a little bit more powerful at level 3 once you unlock your Martial Archetype. I personally would recommend the Champion Archetype because this allows you to crit at a 19 or 20. So it pairs well with your Savage Attack uh, feature for being a half-orc. Meaning, uh, with improved critical, instead of having a 5% chance of landing a crit, you now have a 10% chance. So that is really powerful. Another uh, another cool martial archetype for you would be Battle Master. It adds to the, to the utilities that you can use because there are a lot of maneuvers that you can choose. So... Um, it really adds to the customi- to the customization benefits of being a fighter. But those are things that you can look forward to later on. Now at level 1, your focus should be uh, getting close to your targets, hitting them with your pole arm. You can hit them twice because of your po- if you oh sorry, you can hit them once from 10 feet away and then just run away. <laughs> so, let's take a look at your character. Uh, if I oh, may, yeah. uh, since uh, since uh, I think uh, Hatter mentioned about it being awkward to have two weapons, mm-hmm. there is there there's no shame in having two two pole arm weapons. Mm-hmm. It's um, it, if your if your halberd breaks, you have it. You have a spare, and it's funny because you mentioned uh, you are a chef. I imagine um, you taking out a pike. It's not it's not listed under the pole arms, but it's funny because a pike is a giant barbecue stick which you can use to kebab bad guys. So I don't know. That's what I imagine when you talked about when you talked about skewering or hitting enemies. Yes, the halberd is a slicer, so you it's a you can you can totally slice things with that. Like, imagine a giant pizza slicer since we're talking about pizza, and uh, and the hal uh, the, 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 the the pike is a giant pokey pokey stick. So like you know kebab barbecue or you roast you roast your enemies on a spit that's essentially what a pike is and i don't know it's funny it's what i imagined and uh there's no shame in taking that instead of a short sword because Actually, you, 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 yeah. you benefit you benefit from having uh two-handed weapons so i highly recommend getting that oh hmm maybe a, yeah a pike probably do although yeah, I, I was initially thinking maybe a, a pike would be great for a character named vlad well, uh, is that a reference? Yes, that's a reference. Pike Vlad. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, Vlad the Impaler, man. Oh, okay, gotcha. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll get you a pike and we will get you a halberd. This is really good, by the way, having two two handed weapons just in case, because there are times when your weapon will suddenly deal a lot less damage because of. Uh, Let's say if it gets corroded uh, by a certain type of creature, it happens, mm-hmm. and <laughs> I hear Rust some people monster? laughing. It happens. Uh, not gonna give any spoilers on which mod that is, since it's pretty popular. But I have had a few players who are traumatized by corrosion. Yep. <laughs> it happens. So yeah, your AC is sixteen. Not super high, but high enough to dodge a good number of attacks. Uh, your typical. Of being a fighter at level one is pretty straightforward. Just run up to your target and hit them with your halberd. As, and since you can attack from ten feet away, you can hit and run, hit and run. So that's uh, 
very that, that's a fun part about uh fighting with a pole arm. Another thing that I would recommend, I think it would be a shame not to, but you can flavor your pike as a barbecue stick. <laughs> Giant barbecue stick. Uh, and that works. <laughs> yeah. So you can so when you attack when you make your attack on roll 20, it will really it will legitimately say barbecue stick. Oh look, Liam, you roll a crit. And you roll a crit. <laughs> it's it's fake. You have to do it now. <laughs> I uh, uh DM uh Nabi Lanetti is watching right now. She is known as DM Lumpia Queen because uh, one of her first characters fought using a spiritual weapon called a spiritual Lumpia. <laughs> <laughs> so I yeah, it's Mr. Bear gave me the Lumpia. <laughs> <laughs> it was it's a long story involving one of the shenanigans that happened in one of my mods. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, this is your character, pretty straightforward at level one. And what's so much fun about playing a fighter? Is that they unlock something very cool, almost at every level. At actually at every level. At level one, you get your level one. It's uh, it's uh, you get your second wind. Level two, you get your action surge. Level three, you get your martial archetype. Level four, you get your ability score increase. Level five, you get your second attack. Level six, you get another ability score increase. And you get so much every level. So fighters are so much fun to play. Yeah, every level, right? And- Fighters also gain the most ability score increases. <laughs> seven. Sorry? Level, oh, level... T- uh, seven. Seven ASIs. Seven, seven, oh, yeah. seven ASIs. Well, most yeah. classes only get their ability score increases at 4, 8, 12, and 16. Every 4, oh, every 4. Yeah. <laughs> 4, 8, 12, 16, 19. Fighters get right. 4, 6, 8, 12, 14, 16, 19. Rogues have our second <laughs> place because they get 6. The others get 5. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, uh, for the customizable, getting your pole arm master later on, you'll uh, you'll uh, definitely be able to get the pole arm master feat. I strongly recommend getting it at level six instead of level four, because at level four you'd want to buff up your strength. So uh, once you get the ab- ability score increase, you can choose to gain one feat or increase uh or increase two or one uh, sorry or increase an ability by two or two different abilities by one. So I personally recommend buffing up your strength so that just so for the additional damage output. Then level six, go for pole arm master. So Ooh. those are my recommendations. Do you have any questions, uh, Hatter? Uh, none. Awesome, Good. awesome. All right, thank you so much for joining character creation. And once again, I hope that you can uh, join our event on February 28th. We have a lot of uh, Tier 1 games lined up. And actually, a lot of our DMs are spectating right now. So we have DM Cordy, who's running not one, but two games for that day. One will be set in Icewind Dale, and the other one is perfect for level 1 and 2 characters. We also have DM Polar watching today, who will also be running an awesome game. DM Polar has... uh, DM Polar joined this character creation course uh, last year, and now he's already one of uh, crowd favorite DMs. So, strongly recommend joining either of their games, and hope to see you over on February twenty eighth. And once again, Hatter, welcome to the AL universe! Yay! Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Hatter. All right. Next up on queue is uh, Grayzard. Grayzard is unfortunately not here right now. So let's go on to Rigmorum. Rigmorum, are you with us? You are on meet if ever. Okay. Unfortunately, Rigmorum uh, might be AFK. So we'll go on next to Flake. Flake, are you with us? Uh, hi, hello, I'm here. Hi, how Flake. You? How are you doing today? Not too bad. How are you? Doing great. Actually, I'm having so much fun with this character creation batch. Like everyone is like, I'm loving hearing the backstories of everyone, and uh, hearing that uh, some people are trying AL for the first time. It's always a fun experience, and of course, seeing a lot of our regulars like uh, DM Corgi, po- DM Polar, uh, Nabi Lanetti, Trace, etc. Everyone is. Uh, Seeing everyone here is so much fun. <laughs> yeah, that's great too. It is my first time joining. First time, welcome. Uh, yes, I had a friend who tried it out. He he said he loved it really. Uh, I mean, very much. And then I was I I kept on watching 
the Big Bang and I couldn't help oh my God, yeah. notice the guys are playing DMT <laughs> and they seem to be having fun with it. So I said, why the hell shouldn't I try this? Yeah, so actually. here I am. <laughs> totally. You know, um, I have met some of my, like, uh, uh, over on stream right now, Nabi and Trish are here. I have never met them. Uh, I have never met them prior to DND, but right now they're some of my closest friends. Like, uh, I only met, Na I only saw Nadi once. She joined my character creation hey. tutorial last year. Now we're super close. <laughs> she also doubles as my PA because I'm just so horrible at making schedules. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Trish is also my other PA. She handles my schedule as well because uh, she gets OC whenever she sees me miss my uh, miss my labels. I've never met Trish in person, but uh, we've gone so close because of DND. So uh, the DND community is super fun. Aside from the adventures you go on, you also meet the most amazing friends. Oh, yeah, looking forward to that. <laughs> All right, so Flake. Um, so you've never played DND before, is that right? No, nope, never. Perfect. All right, we're excited to have you and excited to show you the wor exciting world of DND. So, uh, uh, before we get started, what type of playstyle do you imagine yourself playing? So we see melee, range, yeah. magic, support, tank. Uh, what do you what do you imagine? Well, at first I was thinking that uh, my idea would be really weird, but then I heard the lumpia thing, and then I love weird. <laughs> Let's go for it. <laughs> yeah, and then I heard the the baker fighter, the master yes. baker, master so. baker. Yes. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, my character would be an OP support. But mm -hmm. not focused on healing. Mm -hmm. uh, he runs around the map helping the other players, mm -hmm. boosting their defense, their attacks, not only healing them, but giving them boosts uh, that they need. So, right. but I was imagining him to be someone who's really fast. He, mm -hmm. he likes to dash around the map, you know, just helping everyone, everyone okay. around, around the map. Something like that, if it's even possible. Everything is possible in D&D if you <laughs> are creative enough. So yeah, we can definitely work with that. Uh, and I love how you say that support that uh, you want to play a support, but doesn't just focus on healing. Because there's a lot of utility and there's a lot of utility that you can do in D&D, &D, and there's really powerful crowd control spells. And there are. Uh, these crowd control spells make it easier for your allies to dish out damage or really debuff your allies. These, I think we have a nice build in mind. Um, for you, personally, I would, rec I would recommend going for a bard. Because a bard, they have a lot of utility, so they have a lot of crowd control. And at later levels, you will, get, you will unlock a certain... Maneuvers that you can do just to add to your speed a little bit. I do have a few other multi-classing op options available, but those get a little complicated. Mainly, what I would recommend is unlocking this spell called Haste. You can get this at level 5 of a certain... Sorry, this is a level 3 spell available to sorcerers and wizards. We can. I'll show you how we can get to that later. But haste is the power that I think you'll really enjoy because you choose a willing creature that you can see within range. Until the spell ends, the target's speed is doubled, it gains a plus 2 to AC, and has advantage on dex saving throws. In addition, they also have an additional action that they can use on their turn. So, what's an AC? What's an AC? AC, that would be armor class. So let's say, you know how in D&D everything is controlled by a 20-sided die? So... If, uh, let's say your AC is at 18, that's this is a combination of a lot of different things that happen yeah. in character creation. If an enemy rolls uh, below 18, that means that they miss. So the higher your AC, the harder it is to hit your target. Okay, that makes sense. All so right. for your maneuvers and CC, I would recommend going for Bard. And then later on, you can, multi you can do what's called multi-classing into a Sorcerer. So by, so by multi-classing into a sorcerer, you will unlock the ability to cast a haste spell. But you'll have to get five levels on sorcerer first. So um, don't. Uh, so you won't be able to be the super speedster that you that uh, that you wanted to be right away. But eventually, you will unlock 
the haste spell, which uh, basically, like, if you're the Flash, you get access to the Speed Force. <laughs> <laughs> Sound good? You're speaking my language. You awesome. are speaking my language. Yeah, actually. Uh, oh, if I may. If yeah, I may. sure. Go ahead. Um, Bard is also one of my first choices because mm-hmm. they are the buff and debuff class in all of D&D. But you mentioned running from battlefield, uh, from running around the battlefield helping your allies. Mm-hmm. And a way that you can do that without having to wait too long to cast haste, you can become a tabaxi or yes. and or and or you can choose to become a monk uh but let me explain um the, yes the monk is a is an offense uh, related class but they are they are not the heaviest damage dealers but they are the class the martial class that deals uh, support in such a way that they can debuff bad guys yeah, with their physical sure. capabilities and um um if you want to be also a magic user um, you can you not, and that controls the battlefield against the bad guys and in the favor of your party. Can't um, I, I, you can't go wrong with becoming a druid because mm-hmm. they are they are also a heavy a, a heavy utility class. A lot of their capabilities happen outside of outside of combat, and if they can be in, and if they are in combat, they are flexible enough that they can be uh, more on supporting rather than. Um, rather than being a damage dealer, so um, there's, or if you, you can pair those up together if you want, go right ahead. Uh, but yeah, those are other options that you can think of. If you want to zoom around the battlefield, uh, you can go monk because the monk is the fastest of the classes. Don't at me. Uh, they they can <laughs> they can run up to like they can run up to like fifty feet every six seconds. So if you wanna if you wanna go brr, you, not gonna lie, you can be a monk. And if you want to control the battlefield in favor of your you and your allies, um, you you can't deny being a druid is also good. They're not just a bunch of uh, they're not just a bunch of nature hippies type of class. You they can but they are good at uh, being a utility caster and controlling the battlefield. That's true. Right, so yeah, actually, yeah, good. this is there's a lot of options to go with this build. You can my personal recommendation is being is uh, multi classing. So your options are like bard. Bard Sorcerer or Druid Monk. So uh, both of them have their, a lot of different pros and cons. Uh, it's more on... It's it's more... But uh, actually for this one, DM Cargy, what do you recommend? Or, wh- which mm-hmm. do you think is better? Uh, bard, a, bard, a Bard Sorcerer or a uh, Druid Monk? I th- uh, what, I, mm-hmm. what, I, what I believe is there's... Uh, it's uh, sure you can have the best classes there, but if you don't know how to use it, they're not they're gonna not mm-hmm. gonna start, they're not gonna accomplish what you want to accomplish. It's a matter of uh, okay, you want to do this, you want to do that specifically. Uh, uh, you can then choose. You can go either way. Not gonna lie, uh, and still accomplish what you want. Uh, it's uh, it's a matter of uh, figuring out which one you want to <laughs> prioritize. Yes. Uh, so if you want to prioritize zooming around on the battlefield. Uh, there's always the monk controlling the battlefield in favor of you and your allies. Uh, you not gonna lie, you can go druid, you can go bard because they're both control utility spellcaster classes. And uh, the sorcerer, if you want to go faster, you sorcerers have access to haste. So in a way, all of these classes can uh, fulfill what you want for your character. Uh, it's a matter of uh, figuring out which you feel works best for what you want to do. Uh, what else? Hmm. Oh, actually, uh, now that yeah. you mention it, I would personally recommend Bard and Sorcerer because Druid mm. and Monk, they can get pretty complicated. And uh, one thing that we want to avoid in for first-time players is to get really way overwhelmed with all the different options. So multi-classing okay. is already a little complicated. So That's personally, right. I recommend Bard and Sorcerer. And as DM Corgi mentioned, uh, it really depends on how well you play the character and understand. So I think you'll have an easier time if you go for Bard uh, Sorcerer. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, and if you want to fulfill the being fast right off the bat, go to Baxi. But I'll g- yeah, I will. G- the races they have they have a lot of options for moving around. So yeah, the is definitely mm. an option. Uh, so Flake, which one would you prefer? Uh, Bard Sorcerer or... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would it make sense for a Druid and then you, you multi-class to a Sorcerer? It's possible, 
but not or recommended. Or is that going to be really complicated? Okay. I don't recommend it because uh, druids gain their power from uh, from the wisdom ability score, and sorcerers okay. gain their power from charisma. So the reason uh, why we recommend bard yeah, sorcerer okay. is because they both get they both uh, get their powers from charisma, while druid monks they get their power from wisdom. Mm, okay. Yes. All right. I think I think bard bard and sorcerer is the way to go. Awesome. So, uh, just a quick a quick segue. Here is one of my characters, uh, Flash Theme. His name is Barry Allen. <laughs> it's like Bear Theme. So yeah, he's the fastest bear alive. <laughs> I like making my characters really cute because it makes the DM feel guilty if they down them. Hi, Nabi. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so you want to go for Bard Sorcerer, is that right? Uh, yes, let's do that. Okay. So, for this one, we're going to... De- so, since we're planning on multi-classing, we want to get something that will give you the immediate benefits and the right proficiencies. So, uh, that gets a little complicated. So, my recommendation is we start out as a bard. This is because bards will gain a few proficiencies that sorcerers do not get. So, for example, a bard will have proficiency in... Loading, loading, loading. We'll get proficiency in uh, in light armor, which is something that, if I'm not mistaken, sorcerers do not get. So it makes you a little tankier. It gives you versatility in using weapons because sorcerers typically they stand in the back and cast and deal and do a lot of magic damage or right? casting fireballs. But I don't think that's really the type of uh, playstyle that you wanted. So I would recommend that we go level one bard. Are you good with that? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Awesome. Now, going on to race. So I have two options that I can th- that uh, we can give you. Uh, just let me know if you if you're happy with them or if you want to change it up. So the first one, as the Porgy mentioned, is the Baxi. So uh, cat. So this is the cat folk character. So what's cool about the Baxis is that they have this ability called T line agility. So your character typically has thirty feet of movement. Now, as a Tabaxi. You can move your 30 feet, which will then burn all your speed. And then you can trigger your feline agility for free, giving you another 30 another feet of 30. movement. Yes, yeah. so you can move 60 feet in one turn. So this is really powerful. In addition, you also you also have the ability to climb to climb surfaces. That is through Cat's Claws, I believe. Uh, yeah, you have climbing speed of 20 feet. So... Part of your 30 feet. So if you want to like run on walls, uh, uh, Tabaxi will also be able to help you do that. So Tabaxi is a very solid uh, race. The only downside that I will be that I can mention is Tabaxis come from a source book called Volus Guide to Monsters. And in AL, there is this rule called PHB plus one, meaning you can get everything from the player's handbook source book. And from the vo- and from one other source book of your choice. So if you choose Tabaxi, you will be only be locked in to uh, that one source book, Volus Guides to Monsters. And there are a lot of bard and sorcerer spells that you will not have access to since they come from different source books. So that's the only downside that I can say to playing a Tabaxi. Uh, it gets a little complicated, but so far, are you with me? Or yes, do you? Yes. Okay, great, great. But yep, if you have any have questions whatsoever, please let uh, please let us know because we want to make sure that you have a character that you can really enjoy role playing. Right, perfect, thank you. So, oh, did you say it's perfect? You know, it is. Yeah, it's <laughs> anyway, going on, the second option that I can recommend is a human. So, a human, human variant rather. Uh, these are so. This is another option. A human counters the disadvantage of being a tabaxi because a variant human is from the PHB. So you can still choose another source book as your plus one, giving you options to choose a lot of different other spells. Now, as a variant human, you unlock one. You unlock something called a feat, and one popular feat for the speedster type of build is the mobile feat. So let's go ahead and select mobile. So, as mentioned, you have 30 feet of movement. If you have the mobile feet, 
your speed increases by 10. So that means you have 40 feet of movement instead of 30. In addition, if uh, I'm not going to go with this one because that's a little, uh, you'll learn more about that later on. But this one is a cool feature. If you make a melee attack against a creature, you don't provoke opportunity attacks from that creature for the rest of the turn, whether or not you hit. So this means, uh, typically... No aggro. Yeah, no aggro. Yes. Oh, so one thing. So uh, opportunity attack. That's, uh, are you familiar with this or would you like a clarification? Uh, yes. Uh, okay, cool. I, I think that talks about aggro. You hit a creature, but the creature won't hit you back. Yes, that's right. You won't uh, hit the aggro. Typically, when you run away from a creature, when you're right in front of them, they can get a free hit on you. So this prevents that creature from getting that free hit. Okay, so, yeah. super useful, especially if you want to zip around the battlefield. <laughs> so, those yeah. are the two options. Would you like to go for Variant Human or Tabaxi? Personally, I think both of them would be great. It's more on what do you value? What would you value more? The Human, the Variant Human. Variant Human. Okay, yep. nice choice. So, we're gonna, we're gonna, since you're playing as a bard, we're going to increase your dexterity and your charisma. And we'll get to that later. Actually, we'll get to that now. So, um, <laughs> let's choose your ability scores. So, as mentioned, as we learned earlier, as a bard and sorcerer, you get your powers from your charisma. So, I recommend that you keep your charisma as your, at your highest. The second one that I would recommend increasing would be dexterity. Because dexterity will make it harder for you to get hit. So, are you already familiar with these six ability scores? Or would you like a clarification on what they do? I uh, know just the uh, just the uh, constitution and the charisma. Traits. Awesome. I'm not. I haven't seen them in a lot of a lot of RPGs. Awesome, awesome. So charisma, that is uh, how you get your powers from being a bard or sorcerer. It go- also gives you. It also affects your ability to do any RP situation. So persuading someone, lying to them, intimidating them. Those are all charisma skills. Next okay. is constitution. Constitution is basically your hit points. So the higher your okay. constitution, the better. In addition, uh, when you are concentrating on a spell, there are certain spells that have the that have the concentration tag. This means that if you take any damage while you're concentrating on a spell, you will need to make uh, what's called a concentration check. This means that you have to roll a certain number. If you fail to roll that, then you lose. Then the the spell you're concentrating on ends. So, like what we learned earlier, the haste spell. That's a concentration spell. So, the higher concentra- their constitution, the higher the chances of you maintaining concentration on your spell. So, constitution is actually also pretty high up on the list for for your type of build. Uh, does that answer your question? Ah, uh, yes. Awesome. Yes, it does. So right. I'm curious. So I'm curious now. How how are we gonna build that if if we need charisma as your main stat and then mm-hmm. dexterity as your secondary, but then you still need constitution, you know, up there really high. Yeah. Uh, Wouldn't you can... I have any problems with my points? Yeah, you just rank them from highest to lowest, and then we'll adjust it later on. Uh, as long as your constitution is in your top four, I think you'll be fine. All right. All right. So, what would you choose as your number one, your most powerful ability? Yeah, that's gonna be charisma. Awesome. And then the next one would be constitution. Well, cool. the rest will be dexterity. Dexterity. All right. Next, uh, what's your fourth highest? Uh, what does wisdom give me? What does right. it give me? So the common the. There's a, actually, that's a good question because a lot of new players, they get confused with the difference of intelligence and wisdom. So the best way I can explain it is intelligence is your book smarts can while I, wisdom I, is I? your street smarts. Yes, can Navi, I, go I? ahead. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> the difference between intelligence is wisdom. is a, Intelligence is knowing that uh, a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is knowing that you don't put tomato in a fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to explain it, <laughs> but yes, uh, well, like that uh, works on me because I don't eat salad anyway. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. so as Nadi mentioned, like uh, uh, tomato is a fruit, so that's book smarts, 
And yeah, you'd be crazy if you put tomato on a fruit salad. So that's street smarts. <laughs> Another example I can give is imagine you're walking down a very sketchy neighborhood. Now, a person with high intelligence might have read on Facebook or might have read on the news that there's a lot of crime in this city. So going through this neighborhood on, in the middle of the night would probably be a bad idea. Now, a person with high wisdom, on the other hand, has a lot of street smarts. So they would notice, they may not have read about the high crime rate in this neighborhood, but they would be able to notice things like it's very dark around here or there's a lot of people that are, that are uh, sniffing rugby by the sidewalk. So going through this sketchy neighborhood might probably get me mugged. So that's the difference between uh, intelligence and wisdom. Street smarts versus book smarts. Uh, right. Does that answer your question? Yes. 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 You, like, learn, of- you learn about things. You learn about things by reading about them, or from hearing about it, or from from reading about it versus experiencing it. Uh, yes. That's the diff- also one of the key differences between intelligence and wisdom. Uh, uh, learning learning via study versus learning via experience. So that's another different way to differentiate them. I love the tomato metaphor. It's my favorite thing. Thank you for using it, by the way. <laughs> Moral of the story: Please do not put tomato on fruit salad. <laughs> Anyway, or anything, or anything. Don't put on anything. But 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 uh-huh. but you can use your charisma to sell tomato-based fruit salads and convince people that it's good. Yes. yes. You can intimidate people into putting the tomato in a fruit salad. Yeah, that's yeah, a very popular metaphor. That. Dude, if I have low cur- uh, low wisdom or intelligence, my charisma would make up for that cuz totally. I'll just, I'll just lie to people. They won't even know what what hit Totally. Them. Totally, totally. But yeah, uh, right. recommendation uh, by the way. Points left. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll just rank them from highest to lowest. Uh, can we do? Can we do wisdom and then strength last? Wisdom and then strength last. Got you. So wisdom is your is your fourth. Intelligence would be your fifth. Is that right? I know. Uh, strength will be the last. Strength will be the last. So strength yes. will be your sixth or fifth. Yep. Uh, fifth. Fifth. Okay. So your intelligence will be the lowest. Okay, great. So I just, don't like books. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Uh, welcome to the 8 Int Gang. <laughs> Personally, I love playing 8 Int characters. <laughs> They're just so funny. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, we have nice even numbers. So one lesson I need to that I just need to explain is that we want all your abilities to be even numbers as often as possible. Because what we're after in D&D is not the actual score like this one. We're after the modifier, and modifiers okay. will only increase at even numbers. At even numbers. Yep. That makes sense. All right. So we're done with that. Let's go on to your class features now. So you have... Oh, actually, rather than that, let's go to your description. So do you have a backstory in mind for your character, the speedster? Uh, I wish I'd known. I would have prepared something, but <laughs> on top of my head... He comes from a nation or a country that lost the, their greatest war. Mm-hmm. Then that country wanted to preserve their their essence by making my character survive. Mm. Okay, okay. So he's like the last, last remnant <coughs> of that country. But... In the course of the adventure, he's trying to, to look for a place where he could, you know, start up again. Mm. All the other countries have been declining him or just, you know, not giving him any <laughs> chance to prove himself because he has very low attack strength. I say mm. strength. But, I they do, but they do not know that he is a very, very strong support that would actually... You know, countries would fight for for someone like him, something like that. Like he gets judged immediately because he's, let's say, a bard, so they know already that he's not gonna be, you know, a really, really strong guy. He's not gonna be in the in the front lines. But they, what they don't know is that he's really adept in supporting, like, you know, OP, overpowered supporting, something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's so he gets cool. Judged a lot. That's actually a really nice narrative to go on because it shows that. Uh, strength and power come from different from come from come in different shapes and forms. So I love that narrative. So here are my recommendations for backgrounds. So the first one that I can recommend would be soldier. So 
you have a big heart and you wanted to protect your country, your town, your village. And that's what made you decide to be a soldier. You were always looked down on because you never had that brute strength that most of the soldiers have. But your heart is more powerful than, than your sword. So that's one narrative that we can go on. Another one that I can recommend would be The Haunted One. So The Haunted One is actually pretty popular today. So The Haunted One is... Where is H? Here you go. The Haunted One is basically you suffered from a very big traumatizing event. And it's something that haunts you to this day. So seeing your entire village massacred and getting survivor's guilt along with PTAs, with the PTSD is really a nice narrative to go on. So those are my two recommendations. Uh, which one calls out to you more? The Haunted One sounds really good. All right. Cool, I, cool, think, cool. I think it is Mr. Bear, so... I have a yeah. question. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Is that the Dragon Casualty? Dragon Casualty? Uh, what source book is that from? Uh, it's from uh, Tyranny of Dragon Season 1 AL Sources. I'm not sure ah, if that's I allowed see. here. I, 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 it, it's it's an old one. It's it's from a while back. I'm not sure if they're still using it today. But there used to be something called Dragon Casualty. Where um, uh, the, when he said uh, his village was massacred and town was destroyed by an enemy, by enemy forces. I, I, the first, that the, that's the first thing that I thought of. That they sent powerful... Uh, their powerful machinations or, I don't know, a, a creature under their control or maybe their, the opposing city that's warring with them has a dragon and they happen to use it to destroy where he's from. And then um, his town would be all, it's too late for us, we need, you to, we need you to get out of here so that you can survive, so that you can survive for us, live on, uh, uh, we live on through you, something like that. Um, and yeah, that's the first thing that I thought of, the dragon casualty, because... Yeah, it sounded it sounded like it matched the story. <laughs> Sadly, the one is Dragon really Casualty is not listed here, but we can always customize backgrounds. So I think uh, the closest thing to that Dragon Casualty would still be Haunted One, actually. So, yes. uh, are you are you okay, are you okay with this? Uh, are, are you okay with this flake? I mean, the dragon thing <laughs> sounds. I think it sounds. Yeah, <laughs> in the Haunted One. Yeah, I mean, the backstory. I mean, just the name says it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll I'll see you. I'll see if I, I mean, can if find it. If there's a possibility if we can do that. Then yeah, actually, um, that and these are all just so guides. Many. These are all just guides. Oh, actually, uh, we, you're allowed to make custom backgrounds in AL. So what's it called? Dragon Tyranny. Uh, Dragon Casualty. Uh, Casualty. I will. I found it. I. I it's from. I uh, know. It's from the list of Curse of Strahd backgrounds. It's funny because that's where the dra- the hunt one background comes from as well. Mm, but I'm not sure if that's uh, I'm not sure if that's still allowed to be used today. Yeah. So so what we can do yeah. is just uh, get the background character six of haunted one and just label it as dragon casual. Uh, sound good? Uh, sound good, Flake? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. So haunted one, uh, background character six of haunted one. Second, H. There you go. And proficiency. You have proficiency in two skills and two languages. All right. We'll save this. Okay. So I need you to choose uh, from this list. Choose two skills. So these are things that your character would be good in. Uh, uh, go ahead and choose two. If you have a, if you need a clarification on what one of them does, just let me know. Uh, which of those would be about speed? About speed, uh, acrobatics. Huh. Okay, that's your ability to do parkour. Quick, on his feet. <laughs> All right, and I think uh, you should also have perception, because uh, being able to spot where you're going, it's uh, it's essential. Would you like to go grab perception? Mm. Let's see. What is um? How about insight? What what does insight? Do? Insight. It's the opposite of outside. <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> insight is your ability to read people. And no, so I have, I already have charisma for that. Oh, uh, charisma does is not does not give you ability to read people. Uh, it, it okay. it's just ability to talk to people. So All right. All right. insight is more like, is this person lying to me? Does, do they have a hidden agenda? Um, that's what insight is. Like if you watch Hell's Kitchen, Gordon Ramsay has an amazing BS detector and can tell if somebody is lying to them. To him, rather. 
<laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> it's uh, it's basically your empathy, your ability to connect with others, and and yes, figuring out that they're lying, reading their body language, gauging their intentions. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like uh, you 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 listen to a person talk, and you can feel if they're sus or if they're not sus. All right. How about sleight of hand? Sleight of hand, ability to pickpocket or to move or to grab something without somebody noticing. Ah, uh, let's go with that. Okay. Cool. 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 Next Your ability we... to shuffle cards, very, very cool in a yes. cool way. <laughs> we just so... lost everything, so we need to we need some funds to start with. All right, cool. And next up is uh, your languages. So since you are a dragon casualty, I think your character would spend this time learning about dragons and picking up on draconic. Uh, would you like to select that? What is what is the oldest language in the game? Deep speech, I believe. Uh... I believe that would be... the language of the aliens. Primordial, oh, right, right. Uh, in the world of Thoril, uh, mm -hmm. it, the, it, the, the, the planets used to be like merged into one. Uh, and then a, a giant split happened. And there became the plane of the, the material plane and the plane of the elementals. So, not gonna lie, Primordial sounds like a very, very old language. And DM Mr. Bear, I sent you the link to the Adventurers League uh, PDF for Curse of Strahd backgrounds, including the Haunted One and the Dragon Casualty. I like if, the fix, because I much. If uh, if the if the player finds it very appealing, you can check it out. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All yeah, right. I'm I, I'm gonna go with the uh, primordial. Primordial. Okay. I want it, I want to give it a sense of experience. Like if, let's say, someone else know knows the language, they would like be automatically connected because there are very limited people who know the language, yeah. and. And you are yeah. a bard, so coming up with the history, so knowing the history of uh, of the universe is something that I think you'd uh, that that uh, you would come into battle knowing. Yep. yep. So you also know have the ability to speak one other language. Which one would um, I personally would recommend uh, Draconic because because you're a dragon hunter, but some other races that would that would be good soldiers would be. Dwarvish or halfling or elvish. These are the common common races that you may have encountered. What are what are the common common big bosses? Like are they are, are they dragons? Are they orcs? Mm, there's no common in the end. It's like uh, there's some mods that really fight uh, dwarves, orcs, uh, dragons. Uh, sometimes the the, the big boss. boss is a human. So there's okay, not really. So uh, okay. Okay. All right. Let's go with draconic. I think. Draconic is, it just makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's cool. And now we have that set up. Let's go to your class features now. So you have proficiency in. Let's go for your skills first. Choose three skills from this list. And again, if you need a clarification on what one of them does, just please let me know. So, so, um, so I don't have to choose the the, the things with the dragon casualty because I already yep. have them, right? That's right. All right, so let's go with insight, the opposite of outside. All right, nice. <laughs> and then stealth. Stealth, gotcha. Yep, we'll go with stealth and. Sorry, could you click on that before? Oh, me? sorry. Animal handling. Animal handling. Okay. Just to clarify, though, uh, a lot of new players select animal handling. Because they think that it will help them get an animal animal companion. Um, that's usually I don't know, what do you use not that the animal case. to attack someone. Yeah, it's not gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> so what you can do is actually purchase an animal in, and then uh, yeah, you can use that car that that animal as a mount. But actually, getting like finding a random animal and saying attack that, it's not gonna work. <laughs> oh, okay, so let's change that then. Uh huh. All right. Um, let's see. What is what is performance like? Performance. It's your ability to uh, it's your your ability to sing, dance, uh, spoken word for the amusement of others. Okay. Rap All battle. Right. Rap battle. Yes, that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought I was on mute. <laughs> That's like the first time I heard that. Normally, it's I na mute pala ako. This is the first time someone was like, "Oh, I thought I was on mute." <laughs> All right. He's so very, he's very conyo. He's very conyo. <laughs> yeah, that's like us in the house, yeah. <laughs> All Let's right. See, um, intimidation. 
Intimidation. And intimidation is the opposite of? Outimidation. Easy. Yeah, exactly. Or pwede rin oh, intimidation. Oh, nice one. Good job. Okay, sige. Doon na yun sa'yo, siyempre, boss. Alright. So, as a bard, you also have proficiency in three musical instruments. So, go ahead and choose three. Uh, that's gonna be the flute, and then we have what do you call this small guitar? Like a... uh, that would be a lute. A lute. Okay, that's it. Mm-hmm. And one more. Then... It would be weird to go to battle on a lyre. Let's say horn. Nice. All right. Got you. Okay. So one thing I gotta show you as a bard is your bardic inspiration. So this is one interesting support, uh, semi-support thing that you can really do. As a bonus action on your turn, you can choose a creature that can, uh, within 60 feet, that can hear you. And you can give them a bardic inspiration. This is 1d6. So as we learned earlier, everything in D&D is mainly controlled by a 20-sided die. So let's say your, your opponent, your ally, needs to roll, let's say, a 16 to hit the target. But they only roll at like 14 or a 15. If they already have your bardic inspiration, they can roll a d6 and add it to the total value of yeah. their d20. So it's super useful. You just need to predict who will need their bardic inspiration the most. And the thing is, this lasts for 10 minutes. So that's pretty long in D&D because one round is only 6 seconds. So 10 rounds is only 1 minute. So it lasts for a long time. Uh, okay. Yeah, so Bardic Inspiration is a great way to... But that to 10 minutes, help. that only applies to that one creature? One or creature, can I switch? Yes. Okay, alright. All right. Uh, but you can give... Uh, you have a number of Bardic Inspiration dice equal to your Charisma modifier. So, you have... I have three, I think. I have three. Three, three yeah. Bardic Inspiration dice. So, use them wisely, and you get them back at a long rest. So, there's two types of rest in D&D. There's a short rest and a long rest. You'll get all your spells and all your Bardic Inspirations back at a long rest. So use them wisely. So now let's go back to your race. Let's choose one last skill. Choose one from this list. I think we gotta have medicine. Medicine. As a backup plan. Yeah. All right. Medicine though uh, does not heal your allies. It's only good for stabilizing them. So it will not uh, increase their HP. But mostly medicine is good for like CSI stuff. Like finding the cause of death of this creature. How about um? How about Arcana? Arcana, that is your not. That does not affect your spell casting. It's good for. It's good for. It, it's Arcana. Is about your knowledge of magic. So let's say you enter a dungeon and you see this weird drawing on the on the door. A person with high Arcana might know that this drawing is a glyph, and if you touch it, it will explode. Okay, we we'll go Arcana then. Okay, works best with the primordial thing. Yeah, language. Yeah. And lastly, we can choose one last language. Uh, we have draconic and we have primordial. I recommend that we get something a little more common. So maybe yeah. elvish, dwarvish, gnomish, uh, um, and dwarvish or halfling. Let's go with elvish because gotcha. he, he he's a good singer. All right, noted. Okay, so we have that set up. Now let's go to the fun part, choosing your spells. So, in D&D, we have what's called spell slots. At, as a level 1 bard, you only have, if I'm not mistaken, two spell slots. But you have four known spells. That means that you know four spells, but you can only cast two of them. Two or of them. two of the same one. Because, you have, because every time you cast a spell, it will consume one of your spell slots. And you only get your spell slots back at a long rest. So use them wisely. But on the other hand, there are these simple spells that are called cantrips. Cantrips do not consume a spell slot. So you can cast them as often as you'd like. Okay. So first off, let's go select your cantrips. I personally recommend getting one damage dealing and one support cantrip. So the first damage dealing cantrip that I can recommend, there's only two, is Vicious Mockery. And the second one is Thunderclap. So, Vicious Mockery, basically you you yell a lot of insults at one at one target. Oh, yeah. I know. You, <laughs> yeah, you, you saw the target. That's really me, so 
I'm not gonna be. I'm not All gonna right. even let you finish that. I'll take that. Let's <laughs> lock that in. So yeah, this is actually pretty. Uh, this is actually. Uh, it only deals a little bit of damage, like one d four psychic damage. But what you're really after is the fact that they are so heartbroken from those strain of insults that they have disadvantage on their next attack roll. So disadvantage means that remember everything's controlled by a d20. They will roll two d20s instead of one, and they will get the lower value. So makes it harder for them to hit their attacks because they are too busy crying over those insults. <laughs> so the next one, we can, we need a utility cantrip. So uh, here are the best utility or RP cantrips that I can recommend. Uh, the first one is light. As a, as a human, you do not have any dark vision. So having the ability to see in the dark is super powerful. Light it basically turns you into a flashlight and you start glowing brighter than a vampire from Twilight. <laughs> Mage Hand, you conjure a spectral hand. They can use it to open doors that you think are trapped. And that would be really useful. You can also flavor it as you running to the door, opening it real quick, and running back away. So that's another way to use uh, Mage Hand. Next one is uh, Presti Digitation, which is also known as the hardest spell to pronounce. <laughs> It gets you a lot of harmless sensory effects that are really good for flavor purposes. So um, let's say you're going to meet a queen and you just came from battle. So you're all bloody, you're all sweaty, you're really dirty. You just snap your fingers and press the digitation. You are now clean. It also, it also like you can also make smells appear. You can clean objects. You can make sparks appear. Press the digitation is a cool RP ability. So those, I'm, curious about, um, yeah. I'm curious about Minor Illusion. Yes. Minor Illusion. You create a small illusion within a 5-foot cube. So there are two ways you can use this. You can make a small sound that can range from a whisper to a scream. Like it can be like a lion's roar, the beating of the drums. And it lasts for, it lasts for one minute. Another option is to create an image such as a chair, muddy footprints, or such. Remember, it's only it can only fit in a five foot cube, so you have to be uh, creative with what you put there. This illusion cannot move and cannot create any sound or smells, so it's one hundred percent visual only. But uh, if you're creative enough, actually, with all illusion spells, you really have to be creative if you want to get the maximum output. So you have to be creative with how to use this, and if you're creative enough, it can really be game changing. Actually, just to share a story with Minor Illusion, in uh, one of my in, in one of my friends' games, uh, this was uh, DM Lumpia Quino earlier. Uh, we were playing a certain mod where we had to convince somebody to side with us, uh, convince to convince him to come to the caravan. When we met up with him, he was being attacked by a Pegasus, which we easily chased away. Now this man was so stubborn and refused to come with us. So I asked the DM, DM. Can I peek inside his house? Because he ran back inside his house. So I was like, she was like, okay, yeah, sure, you can. Okay, can I see anything inside? Now, can I cast fog cloud? So I cast fog cloud. It basically made the entire place smoky. He couldn't see anything. And then I used minor illusion to create Pegasus noises. And then I just started shouting, oh no, the Pegasus is here. Run, get out, get out. It's going to attack you. <laughs> okay, okay. We had to stop playing for like one minute because we were too busy laughing. <laughs> so yeah, uh, requires a lot like of creativity. I, li- I like I like the minor illusion. It looks uh, handy. Awesome. So vicious mockery and minor illusion. So those are your cantrips. Now let's go for your spells. You so, know what else? Minor illusion. Oh yeah, do? yeah. What's up? Um, if your if your character is the only one that can understand a certain language. You can create subtitles for your party mates to read. <laughs> Actually, I never thought of that. But I'm totally using that now. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we do it all the time. Uh, uh, you're reading something, or your your character is reading something out loud, and you present uh, subtitles for your party mates so that they can all read it. So you, the letters are all there. A minor illusion fits in a five foot five foot cube, right? Yep. So that's a lot of subtitles <laughs> for worth of uh, that's a lot worth of, a lot of words for your party mates to be able to understand. So it's a very good it's very good utility as well, not just for uh, role playing specifically. So very nice, minor illusion. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, for that. awesome. So now we're going to go for your spells. So remember, you only have two spells per at level one. 
So you need to use them very wisely. So the first one I can recommend, of course, as a support, self. you're yep. going. Oh yeah, this guy self too. True, true, true. Um, so you wanna go? You wanna grab this guy self off the bat? Uh, yes, yes. Please. All right. Cool. Are there any other? So yeah, this guy self. Uh, it's not perfect. Like you can disguise your weapons, armor, clothing, etc. Um, you can make yourself seem a foot taller, a foot shorter. But if there's any physical interaction with the illusion. Uh, things will pass through it and it'll be obvious that it's an illusion. So just don't let I people would, touch I you. Would, I think it would work best with with someone with really max charisma. I think it would yeah, work. Yeah, it would. That. There are a lot of times I, I broke games using this guy's self. Um, like, uh, there's another story. I was it, My team and I were infiltrating a very... Uh, we're infiltrating a, a villain hideout. And... We were supposed to find this one person. His name was, uh, people called him Fat Pip Yap. Uh, so I re- we found him and we're like, hey, are you Fat Pip Yap? Because this person's looking for you. It turns out that Fat Pip Yap was actually a spy. And he ran inside, started shouting like crazy. Oh no, intruders, intruders. I was like, shit, we just blew it. So thinking quickly, I casted this spell called Detect Thoughts, which allowed me to read minds of other people who are nearby. And then I used this guy's self to turn myself into another guard, which we just killed. And I ran into the BBEG's quarters and was like, Don't believe Fat Pip Yap! That man is lying! He killed everyone inside! That stuff, that's an imposter! So it basically became a series of charisma checks. And because of that, we were able to bypass that entire final battle. <laughs> I mean, that, that alone sounds really good. So yeah. But again, definitely... you gotta be creative. Uh, yeah, illusion spells, really creativity. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's solid. Are there any other spells that call out to you, or would you like to hear any recommendations? What is a silent image? Silent image. This is another illusion spell. So this one's a little bigger than a minor illusion. It's a fifteen foot cube, and you can make it. And uh, you can use an action to move that cube. But uh, what silent image is really used for is that uh, uh, it's that silent image is something that you can see through. But people, other people cannot. So if you want to conjure like a 15-foot wall, you can see through it. Your allies and your opponents cannot see through it. So if you say you're, you're attacking with a crossbow and you fire at the, at the target, they can't see you, but you can see them. That means you get advantage on attack rolls. This will also work for your allies because physical interaction reveals it to be an illusion. So if an ally touches the wall they will immediately see through it as well. So if you have an archer in your party, you can cast them a silent image in their location so that they can fire at the target and gain advantage. Yep. Yep, I like it already. I see that you like uh, spells that really mess with your targets. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Avoid avoid confrontations as much as possible. I love that logic. Most uh, new players, they love to hack and slash. Uh, but they don't realize that uh, RPing is essential in D&D and bypassing encounters, there's nothing more rewarding than that. <laughs> yeah, I got, I, got, I, got, I got that from a context clue you said, I mean, earlier. Mm-hmm. I mean, about grinding. So I thought, I, I don't think I need, I really need to to be some sort of a fighter or a battle mage or something. I just need to survive the whole game. Something yeah. like that. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And you win. You win. You uh, survive one hundred percent of the battles that you do not, where uh, you are not killed. Yep. Wait, last one. There you go. <laughs> so I think another spell that I think you'll really enjoy is Tasha's hideous laughter. So Tasha's hideous laughter. You point at somebody and you tell them a joke. They just fall on the ground laughing for the duration of the spell, and uh, it's a great way for taking an enemy out of combat. Best part is that once while they're on the floor laughing, they are uh, how do I put this? They are incapacitated and they are prone, meaning melee attacks against them will have advantage. But of course, right. if somebody somebody hits them while they're laughing, they get to try. They get the opportunity again to resist the spell. The spell that you cast on them. It's good for incapacitating bad guys. And then you can just end the fight without killing the guy mm-hmm. and just run and just and just leave them there laughing for a yes. while and then uh, get out of there as soon as you can and not waste time if you if you're mm-hmm. in a hurry. That's true. Uh, and if you're all you mentioned, you want to be a support 
kind of person who 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 is uh, who provides support ar- around the field. Uh, yep. he control spells like sleep or um, fair or uh, well, we'll see which we'll see which appeals to you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here are the other spells that you can choose from that uh, DM Cordy and I can recommend. So aside from Tasha's Hideous Laughter, there is also Sleep, where you can immediately put a bunch of creatures to sleep. Uh, you roll 5d8, so that's a maximum of 40. And it, Sleep will immediately go to the, to the weakest enemy. If uh, their HP is less than whatever you roll, they will instantly be incapacitated and fall asleep. The downside to sleep is that it's very situational, and once you get to later levels, you really won't get to maximize it as much as you'd like. Another spell you can change it as long you can change it as long as you are still not playing your first level <laughs> five game. Sleep is very good, very very good at tier one, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you're dealing with mobs. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a wide range. It's it's the same range as fire the same radius as fireball by the way. Uh, it you can incapacitate low HP multiple enemies at once, and it's non concentration. So even if you even if uh, even if they're asleep and a new batch of enemies shows up, you can cast it again in their direction. Um, uh, I have seen it at work. I've seen someone in my group who uh, at uh, at low level was able to crowd control the entire enemy party without killing them especially if you're playing adventures that specifically tell you don't kill anyone but <laughs> you need to find a way to incapacitate them sleep is a good way to do that um so again but it's only good at lower levels if you're going at t- higher levels of play it's not going to be as effective that's true all right what's the, what's the huh? difference in duration for sleep and tasha's uh, laughter is it Tasha's? it's the same yeah. they're both at one minute one minute okay so yeah. another option that I can recommend would be Fairy Fire. So uh, this is a really all-around support. This is a really popular support spell because it focuses on uh, controlling the battlefield. So uh, it's an AOE spell, 20-foot cube, and you spray light at that area. Creatures will have to roll a certain number, and if they can't roll that high, they become outlined with the color with that color with that uh, light. And when that happens, they shed a dim light. They cannot benefit from being invisible. And at all attacks against them will have advantage. So it's a great way to make sure that your allies get a better chance at hitting your targets. And if you know if they're if they're clumped up together, that's even more perfect. The last one that I can recommend for your uh, for your uh, battlefield control would be Bane. So you uh, you choose up to three creatures. They have to roll a certain number, and if they fail, that means that all their attacks and saving throws they will be deducted by. They will receive a one d four deduction. So if they roll, let's say a sixteen, nope, they're bane. They roll a d four, and let's say they roll like a two. So that means their new roll is at fourteen. So it can potentially change the outcome of mo- of a lot of uh, attacks. Okay. All right. How many? How many of these do I get again? Do I do I get two or? Four? You can get two more. Two more. I get because you already more, chose right? uh, silent image and you already chose silent image and disguise self. Disguise, disguise but self. I would also recommend getting a healing spell like cure wounds and healing word. Uh, would so, I? Are potions available in game? Like, can I buy potions? Yes, they are. You can you can still buy them. Uh, just take into account, though, that uh, potions are pretty limited, especially at early levels, because they are pretty costly. And uh, I would recommend getting at least Healing Word. Let me just explain the difference between the two healing spells available. There's Cure Wounds, which uh, heal, which takes one action to do. So there are three things that you can do during your turn. There's an action, a bonus action, and movement. So Cure Wounds, you have to physically touch your target. It will consume your action, meaning you cannot attack or cast a spell anymore. Uh, that requires an action. But it will heal your target, 1d8, plus your spellcasting ability modifier. So your spellcasting ability modifier is charisma. Your charisma is plus 3. That's so great. it can heal a maximum of 11 HP. So uh, the other option is Healing Word. Healing Word only, only takes a bonus action, meaning you can cast Healing Word, 
and then you can still make an attack. It also has a range of 60 feet, so you don't have to physically touch your target. And But the downside to that is that it only heals 1d4 plus your spellcasting ability modifier, making the maximum heal only 7. Okay. But I would recommend getting at least a healing word so that you can still uh, use your cantrip for vicious mockery, or you can still make an attack with your, with your crossbow. Yeah, I think let's take a healing word. Okay, nice. And now for your final spell. My recommend uh DM Cordian, I recommend Bane, Fairy Fire, Sleep, and Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Which one calls out to you the most? And bear in mind, bear in mind <laughs> that uh you can get uh, that you can still uh, get more spell slots later on and you can still and every time you level up you gain an additional spell. Okay. Let's let's uh I'm just basing this because laughter is loud and mm-hmm. sleep is silent. Let's go with sleep. <laughs> I think you would go it. best with infiltrating stuff or okay. trying to steal stuff. Perfect, perfect, perfect. To be sneaky, sneaky all around. So my recommendation for sleep is uh, you look, you uh, cast it. You don't cast it right off the bat. You cast it when there are a lot of low HP creatures in a, in a specific that are clumped together in an area. But also take into account though that sleep, there is friendly fire involved. So it uh, you have to make sure that your allies have more HP than your opponents before casting sleep if you're going to be casting it in that radius. Okay. All right. But yeah, yep. these are solid spells. So we have those set up. Let's now go to your abilities. That's all done. Description is all done. Now let's go to your equipment. So, you want to be a speedster. You're going to need a weapon. So, uh, do you want to deal melee damage or range damage? Range damage. Range damage. So, let's go ahead and get you a uh, crossbow. You are... Uh, since you're a bard, uh, you... You're haunted, so let's get you a diplomat's pack since your character is someone who wants to evade combat as much as possible. This gives you a bunch of flavor items that really won't help you out uh, unless it's very situational situations. And now let's choose an instrument that you have. You can choose a flute, a lute, or a horn. A flute. Lute, got you. And that is it. That's your character. Let's add everything. Adding that in. So here is your character. Let me add everything to your car- to your inventory. This right, yeah. So this is what we mentioned earlier. Your armor class is thirteen, so that's pretty squishy. So as much as possible, try not to get hit. Now you have a lot of uh, of speed at forty because of your mobile feet. So since your dexterity is higher, since you have a pretty decent dexterity, you'll be attacking mainly with your crossbow. But as a bard, your spells are generally more powerful. Uh, it's just that uh, since you only have two spell slots and all of none of your spells deal damage, typically you want to focus more on controlling the battlefield or aiding your allies. <laughs> so use your spells only when they're absolutely needed or when you think it will really turn the tides in battle. Vicious Mockery is a good way of uh, preventing preventing allies from getting hit. So use Vicious Mockery uh, when you think that the enemy when you think that the enemy is going to attack somebody with low AC. Because uh, again, Vicious Mockery only deals one d four damage, but that disadvantage on the next attack will make them will make the attack more powerful. Oh, sorry, will make it less likely for your ally to take damage. But otherwise, at level 1, try to just attack them with a crossbow if your goal is to just deal as much damage as possible. Lastly, you have your Bardic Inspiration. Use them wisely. You can give your Bardic Inspiration to an ally and potentially change the outcome of an attack. So that is your level 1 Bard. Do you have any questions, Flake? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, so just want to... So I'll give you a I posted a link over down at hashtag uh, claim your characters here 
So go ahead and access that link. And you, once you claim the character, you'll be able to add it to your D&D Beyond account. And since you're a new player, I want to invite you to head over to our event on February 28th. DM Corgi will also be DMing a mod that's perfect for new characters. Uh, it's friendly towards level 1 and level 2 car- uh, uh, players. Uh, it's The registration fee for that event is only 140 pesos. Now, aside from being able to play all the games lined up for that day, you will also gain a gift certificate worth two hours of gameplay in Tabletop Lounge, the physical location of Tabletop Lounge. In addition, we also have merchants who, are, who will be on the will be on the Discord server on that day. You will they're giving out a few prizes as raffle prizes, so you'll get a chance to win those as well. So, if ever you're interested and want to sign up. Uh, please head on over to a Grand Adventure. This is the online event here on the Discord server. This is entirely online. And uh, we look forward to, to officially welcoming you to the D&D community. Yay! Yeah, likewise. Thank you. <laughs> Looking forward to it. All Thank right. You so much. Thank you so much, Flake. And lastly, uh, Jellofish is still not here. Grazard is not here. Rig Morum, are you with us today? Unfortunately, I think Rig Morium is AFK. So while I'm here, uh, while everyone is here rather, I just want to show you some of the cool merch that I got from our sponsors for the event on February 28th. So this one, this is a really cool dice tower that I got from Wild Magic Gaming Oddities. So it looks awesome. Like when I first found this, I saw it as like a must buy. You throw your dice in here and it rolls out here. Uh, of course, you can always just roll your dice normally, but that's kind of boring. When you hear the clickety clacks of it going through the through the wood here, it's so awesome. But one thing that I really love is this dice tray that I got, also from Wild Magic Gaming Oddities, because just uh, sharing with our with our new players today, back in the medieval day ages of D and D, we used to actually we used to have actual character sheets. Can you imagine that? I mean, like having character sheets on paper. But that was long ago. Thankfully, we have evolved to a new generation of D&D where we now have all our character sheets on our phone. And this dice tray has it has a really cool cell phone holder right here. So while you're rolling dice in IRL games, you can have your character sheet available right here. I can't find my phone though. But yeah, you can keep it standing right here so you can see everything that happens. This is like one of my favorite items. I still use it up to date. I also have another one from Dice Key. So... This is a treasure chest that the uh, dice key prepared just that dice key prepared for me and have amazing dice here. So these are translucent dice. So uh, I, I got the colored yellow ones because I'm from Hufflepuff House. <laughs> and this dice set is so cool. Like dice key has really awesome dice available. Both Wild Magic and dice key will be available on for as merchant booths on our February 28th event. Also, uh, Hey Meatling, I got one of their character folios. It's really perfect for IRL gaming. Fortun- unfortunately, I can't show it because I gave it as a gift already. But though the character folio, if you check out their website, they have these amazing D&D notebooks that will also be given out as a raffle prize. Hey Meatling is uh, one of the really popular merchants. Like um, the One thing I'm really looking forward to is their cologne. They have like lawful good cologne or chaotic evil cologne. I'm still waiting for the true neutral cologne. I'm wondering what that smells like. But uh, once it comes available, I'm definitely going to buy from Hey Me Thing. <laughs> All right. So Rigmorum, last chance to, for character creation. Are you with us today? Maybe you got to tag him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, he's not on Defin. He's on mute. But uh Anyway, uh, I'll be doing another character creation session uh, in a, uh, next week. Uh, let me just check when that is scheduled. So I'm checking my schedule here today, courtesy of uh, Trish and Nadi. As I mentioned, I'm just so horrible at making my schedules. It's like I have games almost every day lined up. But uh, yeah, thanks to them, like everything's like so much more organized. <laughs> So yeah, my next character creation session will be at 8 p.m. on Sunday, on February on February 21. So doing another character creation on February 21. So for 
anyone here who is not able to attend character creation today, you still have one more chance before our big event on February 28th. And if you have any friends that really want to that really want to jump in to character creation or are overwhelmed with the basics of D&D or just want to listen to my horrible Tito jokes, please invite them to join our character creation on February 21. So this is DM Mr. Bear signing off. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you DM Corgi for helping out and everyone for spectating. Hope you all enjoyed Character Creation 101. Yay! Bye everyone. <laughs> Thanks DM. Thanks guys. Bye.